I, I said coming into this, I'd be open. Yes. Uh, I'd be more open than I usually am. And so, yeah, you're getting answers that I don't think maybe people would know or maybe people yeah. would have heard before. I was getting beaten up every day, like from year three. My mum threatened them with legal action and to bring the press down. But my mum was absolute fucking warrior. Uh, I also love her. She's a genuine, like, titan. One of the most formative memories I have of white people, white women, yeah. is love, as well as hate. I can go on stage and there is a uh, Machiavellian part of me that goes, I can do whatever I want. Yeah in this moment and one of the feedbacks they gave was to, to one of the actors was well that's not really enough you need to get deeper kind of thing and it's like well no because who are you then to say that this traumatic experience in this person's life that you have asked for one isn't entertaining enough two isn't real enough you're you're asking us to go to places that maybe we haven't healed from or you're asking us to delve into places for the sake of other people's entertainment. I remember coming off the stage and going, I like that. Yeah. You can't stop me. As you can see, coffee. <laughs> That's what we need is the, is the fucking drink of the gods, man. They say it was honey. It's not honey. It was coffee. They say it's honey. I thought they it was say, wine. Oh no, milk and honey was like the, the drink of at least the Greeks. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, fuck that. <clears throat> So that we have in coffee, we have in black gold. That's true. I've only recently, like the last couple of years, got into enjoying it. I'm a coffee snob now. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're really kind of like, you're doing like proper coffee? Oh. Yeah. That's all right. This is perfect. There you go. Oh, thank you. And I'll take the blue because that's the color. Are we ready <clears> to do this? We're ready to do this. We'll see. I'm just, I'm just staring at myself because I look handsome. <laughs> <sighs> Did you just breathe heavily when I said I look handsome? Wow. I breathed heavily because I had to bend down He's and I'm so an old man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you do this for, do you do, do you make noises now when you stand up? Yes. <laughs> do you do that? Oh, ah, ah. It's not just me, my, my knees making noises as well. It's like. <laughs> do you do the whole thing like you can't get up without that? You should see how I run. <laughs> Oh God, I don't, I don't, I don't run anymore, man. I can't be doing that. It's too much oh, on actually, my, um, this is too see. much on my legs, man. My knees yeah, are killing me when I'm trying to run. Can't do that shit. <sighs> okay, let me find. It's actually you. good coffee. My name is. Er <laughs> Story of my fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when you're doing like self tapes, you keep this in, by the way. Yeah. You know, when you're doing self tapes, yeah. and you're like, oh, my name is, and you just rush the entire thing. And you, yeah. Oh, God. I, I, I can do about maybe three takes of the actual, the actual thing I'm shooting. Yeah. Yeah. And then the self tape itself is with the actual introduction of myself. Yeah. I'm two, three, four minutes. Yeah, no. Just trying to say my fucking name. It's, yeah, oh, it's just like, well, I'm, I'm oh, this and this. This is my name. I represented by this agency. Yeah, 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 I'm, yeah, this yeah, yeah. I'm this tall. And then you're just like, I'm low, low, low. I've blah, been blah, in no, blah, blah. I've been in no commercials. I've been in this commercial. I show you my hands. I show you my profile. Yeah. Even that's just like. What, like a fucking golem, do you know? Uh, it's, it's weird, it's really weird. Anyways, my name is Andrea Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? We just make friends that we're crazy, we like being creative, and that's yeah. why we do it. <laughs> and by the way, my today's guest is an actor, my good friend from Working Actors Studio, Samuel Nunez de Souza. Interesting. Oh. Cheers to that one. Because so many people, and I'm going to put the record straight, right? So many people um, before, like, I want to say maybe 2019, 2020, would have literally just called me Sam. I was one of those people. Yeah, and it's yes. just why, yeah. Just, but I don't know, I remember just why I call you Samuel now, because once I asked you, yeah. what do you prefer? You said Samuel, I said, I will never call you Samuel. Thank you. But I do. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Because some people still slip up and it's like, I'm not gonna lie, like, um, before I was there, yeah, before 2019, there was very much like, if someone would call me Sam, I, would, I wouldn't really, it would be more a case of 
conflict aversion, right? Mm. So I'd be like, okay, whatever, cool. Mm. And then my mum had been telling me, like, ever since I was a kid, don't let anyone call you Sam. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my thing. Here's my thing. I'm going to keep speaking anyway while we, while we problem solve because this is how it goes. This is the industry. <laughs> this is the actual industry. And I hope to God, I hope to God Andre keeps us in. I really do because this is what I'll the industry is. So for those of you who are listening and not watching, <laughs> the light just almost fell on my head. I just got it mm -hmm. with my hand. We're sitting outside. <sighs> it's a little bit windy. There are like, there are people... There, like, there, there's some works happening there are somewhere some shops. around. There are yeah. some shops, and I think what it is, someone's just throwing out, like, the empty metal cans that they have. It looks like there's, like, blue barrels there. Yeah. I'm not sure if you probably so, can't see it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but this is what happens. So, genuinely, I, I hope he keeps it in, or at least he edits it slightly. Because you just have to keep rolling. Especially if it's film. If it's film, you just have to keep rolling regardless. You can't let the environment affect you. So... Yeah. That's that's it. I'm gonna put a record straight. So if anyone who's watching this calls me Sam, you know, bro. You know how I'm talking to you, right? <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> I know who they are. All of them are thinking it's them well, now. <laughs> it's all you, especially you. If you think it's not you, it's you. I know. I see you, brother. Yeah. You <laughs> <Right. laughs> like that poster. Look, <laughs> start with the beginning. Start with the beginning. Yeah. Well, Why? I was born. Where, yeah, I mean, <laughs> five like, days you, late. What, what are, do you like, want to know? Where are you from? <laughs> How like, you got into this? If your next question is where you really from, I'm walking out. Okay, <laughs> he doesn't understand what I just said. No, I, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> where are you from? No, where are you really from? Um, <laughs> where are you really from? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a tough question. I can answer you that. That's like it will take a few minutes, but uh, it's all about you, not about me. Are you a London boy? I mean, yes and no. Yes okay. and no. Yes and no. Because okay, so I was born. Born in Kingston, uh, not going to say the year because then you'll age me. Um, <laughs> I don't want that yet. Um, yeah, I was born in Kingston and then when I was maybe five or six, we moved to um, Epsom. So, and if anyone knows about Epsom, Epsom's like got these, Epsom, the Epsom Downs is really nice and posh and then you got Epsom proper, which isn't, isn't that posh. Uh, but we moved in like in the nineties, the mid, mid to late nineties. And um, yeah, it was, it was a real, it was strange. It was strange. I would say that, um, yeah, you grow up and you're maybe like one of, three or four non-white people mm -hmm. in an entire school mm -hmm. and that's going from like infant up to primary and then secondary secondary school to start or high school but yeah no i grew up in born in kingston lived there till i was maybe five mm -hmm. um my mom hates when i say we live just off the cambridge estate but we really did just live just off the cambridge estate um <laughs> <laughs> in a very nice area but mm -hmm. um yes yeah, so i've kind of grown up in the in-between area where I can get in and out of London yeah. in about 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, but I don't have to stay in London. I got like the best and worst of both worlds. Yeah. You know, so we grew up in an affluent area and, but my mum, single mum, uh, literally raised me mm. and was putting herself through um university doing her masters when i was like yeah from the age of maybe seven uh i i wanted to ask you something so you on. said you were in a school where it was like mostly white people yeah how was it for you like does 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 it like how does it affect someone because here's the thing like i'm you shouldn't say I'm from the country yeah. where everyone's everyone is white. white like absolutely <laughs> everyone i i i i i only see Black people on the TV. <laughs> Even, <laughs> now? <laughs> <laughs> Even now? Even now. No, Even no. now. I mean, back then, back when I was little. <laughs> because there, there, there were some students, uh, like from, from, you know, from, from other countries around the world, but mostly just like everyone was white. Absolutely everyone. I would say, as a kid, you're not really aware of it. Mm. So, um, at least for me. So I knew that from the earliest age, um, my mom taught me about like the, like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey, they were like uncles to me in a way. Do you know what mm. I mean? Like I knew so much about 
their lives and what they did, what they stood for, especially like Martin Luther King, because, you know, he's, he's the one, right? Um, and so you knew about racial differences. You knew, you, you know, one of the earliest things I learned was like, you know, as a kid, Martin Luther King, one of his best friends was white. And then all of a sudden when they grow up, they weren't allowed to like be friends anymore. You mm-hmm. know? And so you know that and you understand that. But I think the only reason why that became prevalent to me was maybe year three or four. I was, I was getting beaten up every day, like from year three. Really? Yes. Yes. Fully. Every day. Every day. I was called the, the C word. <laughs> I was called the P word, which was interesting because mm. I'm not of Asian yeah. <laughs> heritage at all. <laughs> and also it's called the, the, the N1 N word as well for, for the longest time. For the longest time. And that was like... I think one of the first times where a school, because they denied it for a long time, they didn't believe it was happening. Hmm. And the only reason why it became apparent was because one of the one of the white girls went home and told their parents mm-hmm. what was happening to me. Of and their parents complained to the school. Mm-hmm. And it was from then that the school kind of went, oh, then he's not lying. Okay, yeah, if, but, if a white girl yeah, says yeah. it's true, it's true. But coupled, coupled with the fact that my, mom, that my mom threatened them with legal action and to bring the press down, my mum, absolute fucking warrior. Uh, I also love her. She's a genuine, like, titan. Yeah. Titan of a woman. So strong. So strong. You know, she had to deal with it as well, you know, because she ended up being on the PTA, and the PTA were, like, horrible. Horrible. And What's I didn't PTA? Really, the PTA? The parent teacher association uh, things like parents who want to yeah, help yeah. with the school and that kind of stuff but she stepped in because there was no black people mm-hmm. on the on the panel and like they were condescending as fuck to her one two things happened the first thing that they decided to do like a, a an assembly on on martin luther king and who he was mm-hmm. as some kind of race teaching and then the other thing was i became public enemy number one for a long for a longest time so anytime really? i made uh a wrong step or um this is the teachers anytime i i acted out as any any kid would do yeah. um i would be like public enemy number one really yeah because, even like from the teachers yes side. because yes because i embarrassed the school oh, we were we yeah were, we were, it was we definitely were, your fault we were a problem yeah we were a problem. that's what it that's what it sounded like <laughs> i remember we went on a we went on a year four trip to Mary Rose, right? To the Mary Rose, which is like an old Tudor yeah. ship. I can't remember. I think it might have been Henry VIII ship. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, and I was excited. And it was me and another kid, another couple of kids, who like we ran ahead. And the teacher was calling us back and kept on calling us back. So we'd go back. Then we'd run ahead. But there was no one else there. Yeah. So and I remember it clearly because we wanted to go and see the ship. The guy had been talking for about half an hour about the ship. Hmm. And I'm like, I want to go see the ship. Why are we still talking about it? I ran, I ran ahead. Yeah. So came back and the school the school rang home because the teacher complained. And I, apparently I had I, I, I had run ahead and I was being disruptive, this and that. And so they banned me from all future uh, school trips because I was, you know, acted out apparently. And it was like, okay, okay. Anything I did now, I was under scrutiny because we complained. So that's 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 the thing. It's like you ask me what it was. You're not aware. You as a kid, I wasn't aware of the racial difference until it happened. Yeah, right. I would kind of expect not from teachers though. That's the problem. That's what like I mean, kids can be like I don't know, idiots, uneducated, like whatever, like their parents tell them, and like sometimes we, like as kids, we can do and say stupid things that we regret later. Mm. But I don't know, but like, no, teachers should be. It's <sighs> to be fair. I think maybe like I mean I have to like also look at myself. I don't think I was the most easy well, kid to teach. I'll be honest. I'll yeah. be. I'll be open. So I yeah. don't think I was a uh, easiest kid to to teach. I was very hyperactive. I think. Mm. Um, I was a handful. I'm much calmer now. 
<laughs> March karma now. Yeah. But I think, again, that's years of, so I think when I was, again, seven, because I getting beaten up, and I was getting beaten up by kids in my year, I was getting beaten up by kids older than me. Like, my mum enrolled me into martial arts at an early age, um, so I could actually, like, toughen up a fight. And fight, and when I started to, I think, remember one of the time I kicked some kid in the, in the face. I still can't be enough after that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because in secondary school, I can't remember guys, ah, oh, another guy who was chasing me for fun. And I literally remember, I, I was like, why am I running away from this kid? So I, stopped, <laughs> kick his ass. I stopped, booted him, in, booted him in the stomach. He doubled over, turned around, kicked him straight in the jaw. <laughs> and he kind of went, yeah. looked at me and I was like, don't, don't, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so I remember that. I remember. <laughs> we don't support violence, but sometimes you have to stand up sometimes for yourself. Sometimes you've got to stand up for yourself. And also, Genuinely. also the different times as well. It's different times. Very different like, times. I mean, you probably, you, you mean kids are, I think kids are more protected now than they were back then. Yeah. Which is, Way which more. is great in one respect. And I also think to their detriment, I think if, if I didn't have those experiences, I don't think I'd be the person I am yeah. now. Um, and I, so I think as much as they were traumatic, I think they made, I think, I think it's maybe a toxic way of, of looking at it. I think sometimes when you're forced to um, confront the world and its ugliness, it can either bring out a really strong thing in you or yeah. not a strong thing. But I also don't think that's binary. I think that I think that those things I still carry with me. Yeah. 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 I think uh, uh, case in point, uh where I'm staying right now, uh I'm in West Norwood and one of the people who are a housemate of mine is uh, someone who I was on tour with in twenty nineteen. Um Izzy. And I'm like we're really cool, we're really close. But I, I know that on that tour, I don't think I was the most, um, in some areas, pleasant person to be around. But because it was rural touring. Mm. And so, and I noticed in myself, whenever we were in like a near major city, or even a city, it would be London, uh, where we go, Liverpool, even Coventry, I would be so much happier. Yeah. And I would be so much more myself and I would integrate more into the group speaking of integration with the riots it's quite interesting um it's quite an interesting topic um I, I would be more willing to be part of the group but the reason why is because when we were in rural areas I was very much aware that mm -hmm. I was the only non-white person mm -hmm. I would see for a week two weeks three weeks yeah four weeks and especially in certain areas you were, um, I have a lot of thoughts going on in my head right now. So I'm going to jump forward and jump back. This is how I work. Uh, this is how I work. Um, going on that tour, I was aware of why people would vote for Brexit. It was the first time living in and around London and living around a major city for the longest time. I couldn't understand. I couldn't fathom how people could vote for Brexit. You go on rural touring and you see these idyllic towns. There's no one who's not white. Yeah. Um, and from the media and everything you get, there's going to be an invasion. There's going to be this, that, and the other, and they just want to, in some, maybe it's racism. Sometimes they just don't want to up, upset the balance of their home. Yeah. And if you're an outsider, they will very much look at you like, hmm. what are you doing here? I remember we went to one castle just, just over the border in, in Scotland. It was our first, going back to a tour. It was our first show um in scotland when we got there and the lady who owned the castle basically turned around and said as we were packing up she was like yeah so i mean we usually let you guys into castles but you know we haven't vetted everybody and as she said the word vetted she kind of scaled me so she said we haven't vetted and she just looked at me up and down vetted everyone and i know a couple of the other guys clocked it and they looked at me like like because they were stumped yeah but i was just sitting there going it's been like that that kind of attitude um, throughout, and that was maybe in July. We started the tour in May, mm. mid-May, mid-May, and that was going mid-May, June, July. Anytime it wasn't a major city, I would be. It would. I was. I was almost almost the depression. Yeah. In in truth, and I it just 
intrigued. It kind of brought back feelings yeah. and memories of being in year three, yeah. being in year four, and getting certain racial comments or being hit and beaten up at school. And then also certain teachers, not all the teachers, but certain teachers of that school um, at the time not being the most supportive or helpful there. And it was, I'm trying to think if there was any black teachers there. There wasn't. I think the first black teacher I had was in high school. Rest in peace, Mr. Cooper, you're a legend. Um, and so I hated, I hated primary school. Yeah. Kind of enjoyed secondary school, but I loved infant school because we moved, we moved from Kingston to Epsom or Yule, wherever it was. Yeah, it was Yule. Um, and one of my first teachers, I cut Mrs. Ross, and she was in Hazel class. And she, those teachers, so going back to the 90s, those teachers, I'm going to shout out. And with the whole racism thing, a lot of people ask me why I don't like, but I'm, I'm fine. I still i am friends with a lot, a lot of white people um, because I look at them and I look at the, again, the content of the career, the content and creed of their character rather than the color of their skin. And those teachers, and I will shout them out, I can't remember all of them, but it was Mrs. Ross, who was in Hazel class, Mrs. Resilian, who was the head teacher, Mrs. Leach, who I love, I love this woman. Um, Mrs. Hewitt, I think she's changed her name now. She's got remarried. Um, and there was a couple of other, I think her name was Miss Languish as well. I can't remember. I could never pronounce her name. Um, they, all white women, and Mrs. Jacobs as well, all white women of a certain, sort of a certain age, and they were like mothers to me. Mm. They saw me lost they saw me having come from a different school in Kingston who they were horrible mm. to me um they really really nurtured and fostered me when I was away from my mom and they really really like loved me and I loved them I loved going to school I remember going into year two and refusing to leave Mrs Ross's class I would I had we were upstairs in year two and downstairs in year one and I refused to walk up the stairs. She had to take me to class every single day because yeah. I was, it was like, you're the first teacher who's actually ever given a shit about me. Yeah. And that she ever nurtured me and wanted to be, wanted me to succeed. And I How felt that. I was a child. I was year one. So I don't know what year it is. Yeah. But I remember understanding the difference of being abused in the school. Not abused, but like the oh, teachers. Abused. Abu abused. Yeah. Abused in, in, it was called the study. And I'm going to, I'm going to, so it's a study in Kingston. I'm going to actually blur it out because yeah. I think it's still around. It was a private school at the time as well. And um, they were cunts. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I, why am I defending them? You were cunts. They were cunts to me. Um, absolute bastards. Yeah. From the, from the students to the teachers. They were horrible. I remember chucking dirt at one of the teachers. Because I remember literally just chucking dirt in her face. Um, and I remember it was my last day. It was my, I remember we were moving from Kingston to Epsom and it was my last day in the school. And um, the teacher didn't even bother to walk me out, didn't even bother to say goodbye. They made me walk. I had to walk across the playground on my own and sit outside for two hours because she said, like, I don't want you in my class, get out. And I, don't, I remember I genuinely wasn't a bad kid then. I don't think I was a bad kid. I was just, I just, I was just had rats and had a lot of energy. But I remember the difference in quality of teaching from the study to West Jewel um, Infant School. And those five teachers in particular, there was an assistant head teacher who became head teacher. I think I can't remember her name. She passed away from cancer like in maybe 2003. She was, she was like Edna Mode. Really, really small, mm. scary, mm -hmm. but like when she loved you <laughs> yeah. and she hugged you, it was like the gift of yeah. God. It was something so beautiful. And so with all those things that happened to me as a kid, one of the most formative memories I have of white people, white women, yeah. is love as well as hate. Mm. And so I've learned to especially in the area that I live in, I mix with a lot of different cultures. I mix with a lot of black people, Asian people, white people. Um, you kind of, you kind of pick, get to pick and choose and kind of get to know who's an ally from an early age. We yeah. didn't have those words then, 
but who's an ally who's going to be your friend and who's going to support you and love you and nurture you and of course also like call you out when you're being a dickhead yeah which is, which important, is, which is very important <laughs> but at the same time you also get to know who's your enemy who's not for you and i learned that from a very very early age yeah so i think as i said the good and the bad kind of um yeah, made me who I am today. Yeah. So long-winded answer to your question. No, I forget no, the question. I love it. <laughs> it, which is essentially um, growing up in growing up as a kid as a one of a few piece people of color. Don't, I don't really like that phrase. Um, I don't really like it. I just, it's always bugged me. But I'll say it for sake of ease. As a person of color, growing up in the nineties in a in a very white predominant area, I think it it made me grow a thicker skin. But at the same time. You carry a lot of, I don't want to say trauma because I think trauma is dramatic, but you carry a lot of baggage. You carry a lot of stuff with you around and it makes you, I tend to sit back a lot when there's a lot of people. Yeah. Because I like to sit back and be quiet because I'm, I've learned to observe and I've learned to not be on the front foot and I've learned to not be as friendly and bubbly, but as I get to know you, yeah. as I get to know you now as an adult, I, my personality comes out a lot more. Yeah, that's true. But it comes out over time. But yeah, I hope I answered your question. I think yeah. uh, I, I said coming into this, I'd be open. Yes. Uh, I'd be more open than I usually am. And so, yeah, you're getting answers that I don't think maybe people would know or maybe people yeah. would have heard before. And to be fair, like, yeah. the thing is, like, it's <laughs> it might sound wrong, but like, I don't know, don't have many black friends as well. It's not like because you know, it's just like I know less black people than white people. And there are like those experiences, especially for me, like coming from, you know, very white country. Yeah. I kind of like, I don't know those. But do you, That's so here's my throwback to you. Do you, when you came over, um, how long have you been here now? 11 years. <laughs> he said, <laughs> how long have you been in my country? Um, <laughs> get your ass out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> some people, some people might disagree. This is your gone. country. No, no, like, there some, exactly, exactly. There were right. some people exactly just recently right. trying it's to so tell recent, everyone. Too recent. Yeah. Um, there were like three bully vans, like on Wednesday and Thursday, like driving from Brixton all the way up yeah. here, like just full of police. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you can't, you can't. Here's my thing. I was saying to my grandma um, and my aunt, where was it? When was it? Like Thursday. So two days ago, <laughs> Saturday now, um, that in, Brixton and that, I'm like, I don't understand. I don't understand why there would be police out. <laughs> to because, protect because, the, the racist, I guess. <laughs> because, exactly. <laughs> because I'm sorry, and I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's sick to laugh at, but actually, let's be honest here. If they want to come, if the EDL and mm. the National Front and all that kind of stuff want to come to a heavy black area, even if you went to Streatham yeah. or two in, you're going to be outnumbered, bruv. And it will be, but you'll be, up, but you'll be outnumbered from the, from the non-white people who live there, but also the white people yeah. who live there. Yeah. Because they, they don't see a problem with it. Otherwise, they wouldn't live in Brixton. They yeah. wouldn't live in, in areas where there's heavily non-white people. <laughs> yes. Do you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't understand the logic of the police anyway. No, but I mean, like, the, anyway. they're the police. They have to protect <laughs> everyone. They have to protect, they do have to protect everyone yeah. and until they start trying to chuck burning bins at you or falling flat on your face. You're an idiot who did that. Well, yeah. what's, what's the, them two people? Like, she got arrested now, innit? Yeah. She's thrown in jail. <laughs> what are you going to throw a burning bin and falling flat on your face for? Like, come on, pattern up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, I was asking you, and the reason why I asked the question, yeah. like, when you came over and that kind of yeah. stuff, when you first came, yeah. did you, did you feel a um, a sense of otherness or unwelcome, or did you feel that you were able to like just integrate purely, purely just get by based on maybe based on the color of your skin? I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much of a I don't know. How, was it a cultural shock to you? Was it not a, a shock? I mean, like in, in like in a way because like no, London is very multicultural. Yes. So like there is a lot of cultures that I never you know like I never seen before. I never kind of met people like this before. But it's also like I think biggest barrier for me was my my like English language because okay. I like. I, I'm, my English is way out, like not perfect right now, but back then, when people spoke to me, they, I think they, they had to wait for a very long time for me to get out the sentence. Here's a, here's, here's a question. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. If, 
if someone was American or if they spoke in like a more American accent, mm. would you find it easier to understand them? You know, what's, what's the funny thing? I mean, yes and no. Okay. Like some British accents, I could understand easily some not, especially I think like Northerners for me were like, <laughs> what is, is, no, I'm, no, please. And I was working <laughs> from first year when I was living here in London, I was working in Russian visa application center. So basically people who want to go to Russia, like, oh, went to, shit, like okay. the, and I was just there, like just like, you know, submission officer. I was mm -hmm. like taking the applications and everything and people were coming like there were a few agents for from tourist agencies who yeah. were like I think like somewhere from north I don't remember now I could barely understand the very nice guys very friendly we like we we kind of we were friends but at the same time a lot of the like conversations were like me just looking at them like ha huh? okay again <laughs> <laughs> again <laughs> Uh, oh, so wow. yes, but the funny thing that it was much <clears throat> easier for me to mm -hmm. understand people who are foreigners here because we all spoke with our own accents, but we kind of like, you know, we used very simple words and we did understand our accents a little bit more. That's a funny thing. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I like that. So it's almost like you have your own little like superpower like <laughs> dialect thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Where you're like, okay, you're from. Serbia, you're from Russia, but you're also from, from Spain, like, you're from like Spain yeah, and yeah, Italy, yeah. and then you're from a like completely different kind of country. Yeah. <laughs> but you're kind of all understanding each other because you all speak with accent, with, with accents, <laughs> with like simple English, <laughs> simple <laughs> English with <laughs> accents, simple <laughs> English with accents. Whereas uh, actual like uh, someone from like a Geordie from from Newcastle or even the Scouts, you'd be like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Or even if you're from like what do you call it, the, the black country? <laughs> um, <laughs> What's the black country? The black country is like the the middle. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's a place. It's a place in. It's a place in England. I think it's the Midlands where. Yeah. But I think it's called a black country because there was like all. It was all industrial. It was just like smog all the time. I mm. think. I don't know. There could be another reason. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know. Let's get to acting. How? Mm. Why? Why like, acting? What, what, what happened? Why did you decide to go into this? You know, profession of constant rejection, I as they say here. Loved as a child, and I think it got beaten out of me in uni, but um, we'll get to that, I think maybe, we might touch on it. Um, <clears throat> as a child, I loved performing. Yeah. I loved being where, where, attention. Where did you start performing? I actually started performing, but it was more like guitar. Oh. So I, as a kid, I learned, I learned guitar. I got up to grade seven, then quit idiot <laughs> so i never got my grade eight i had no idea they're great <laughs> yeah so i started off in classical guitar. so if you if you're in metallica what grade you are i don't know <laughs> I, I genuinely don't know that's a completely different instrument to what i was playing yeah. so they're like that's electric and i was playing classical but if you're like like uh, like so to get to some to big be fair, orchestra to like be or some band like that like do you need to be at least great this or like no one cares just they to be honest to. i think it's more based i don't know anymore mm -hmm. i don't know i've not been in the world for a long time i was a part of a guitar ensemble that toured around italy and spain as a child and i was grade six at the time nice. grade five grade six um but I don't know. I mean, Metallica voice bands, they're great with like the, the scales and that yeah. kind of stuff. So you'd have to have some kind of the theoretical knowledge. I actually don't know a lot about their background, no, to be fair. Anyway. I respect <laughs> them. But no, so I got into it and I really, I, we had like, um, in, again, in my primary school, we had like certain nights where you'd come and do like a, like a, I don't remember, like a gala night kind of thing, or you'd, um, There'd be like a, a thing where where kids would come out and perform and no one won prizes or anything like that, but it'd just be like a performance night. And I got up and I did uh, guitar, but I remember finding the element and playing with crowds as I got up on the stage and the, um, the music stand was too high. So as I sat down, I just went, I don't know, I just went oh, like that. And the audience laughed. <laughs> and so I was like, I like this reaction. Yeah. So I started to play off it and it was about maybe a good two minutes before I even started playing because I was just clowning and the teachers who were like doing a music stand and I was getting a kick out of embarrassing the teacher. It was my year, I think it was my year four, Mr. Skype. I think it was my year four teacher was like doing it for me. And he was like, just play, just play. And I was like, no, I wanna, I'm enjoying this too much. And I played uh, a blues song, like a blues thing I'd learned like a couple of days before and I was really good. Yeah. And I remember there were other guitarists who had gone on and they weren't that good. 
Mm. And so I went and I was really good. Yeah. And the audience gave me a really nice, loud round of applause. Yeah. And I remember coming off the stage and going, I like that. Yeah. And then from there, I got into like doing the school plays. Um, and I found it was like an addiction to being in front of people and speaking and being an orator and being funny or, you know, just being part of that. And also at the same time, maybe you're a little bit shy if you're on, if you get, you know, you get a little bit nervous. I remember one of the, the, the shows, I wanted to pick the most ridiculous thing in the world. I think we did like, it was, a, I think it was Alibaba and the seven and, and, and the, seven thieves or 50 thieves or whatever i can't remember what it was and it was a real like the casting was awkward because again there was maybe like two people who could maybe pass as <laughs> asian <laughs> at a time i was talking like indian pakistani like yeah. area not not like chinese or japanese uh or korean and then everyone else was just white <laughs> and then there was me and a couple other black people as well and they didn't want to be part of it but i was like the teachers were like, um, yeah, so we've got the main cast, blonde hair, blue eyes, you're going to be Alibaba. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is bullshit. Whatever. Okay, fine. <laughs> he, it, was, it, was a tie, it was at the height of Peter Andre, uh, Mysterious Girl, I think. So everyone had to say, oh, boys on, or whatever, or fucking NSYNC. So everyone had the bowl cut thing. And that was popular. I didn't, obviously. Um, <laughs> I had a better hairline than I do now. <laughs> And yeah, they got cast as the main character, as the main cast. And I was, well, I'm going to sit in there go, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is bullshit. Let me, let me figure out what I'm going to do. And where was she like, oh, who wants to be the belly dancers? And I was like, straight in there. <laughs> I was straight in there. And everyone looked at me like, what? And I was like, I will do that because that sounds funny. Yes. <laughs> and so I, um, no, I don't think any of the teachers realized. And it was the beginning of the second act where you'd have to like, you, I remember the dance, the choreography was like putting your foot through the curtain and like twirling it. And then your leg would come through and twirl that. And then, and then the curtains would open and there was, it was like me and like five girls. And I was like, oh, well, I get to be a girl. So this, yeah. is, this is also like, people laughing at me. I was like, yeah, but I'm with these. Yeah. <laughs> so what's wrong? And they were like, uh, can I be better? It's like, no, we can't. Like genuinely, so many boys after I put my hand up and they saw what it was about, mm. they wanted to be part of it. And mm. I was like, nah, it's me, fuck you. Um, and I remember I got again, again, getting the biggest laugh. So that was one of the first times the stage of curtains would open up. And I was there just dancing and doing my thing, mm. chilling with all the girls and that. And, um, the audience laughing. And again, it was just a kind of, it was that re that relationship of, I'm doing this, I'm getting a reaction from the yeah. audience. I'm now center of attention. This is great. I'm enjoying this. Mm. Um, I want to carry on doing this. And getting, going into secondary school, year seven, I loved uh, my favorite class was drama. And then the school, halfway through year seven, for some inexplicable reason, because it was a tech school and they wanted to like promote the core subjects, banned anyone from doing drama until it was year, until it was GCSE. So from year eight and year nine, I couldn't do drama classes. Mm -hmm. we, we, we weren't allowed to do it. Yeah. So year seven was drama, year eight and nine, I was sad. And then year <laughs> 10, it was the first thing I could do. Yeah, it's the It was my first choice for my GCSEs was drama. And because the teacher, Mrs. Powell, um, again, I think she's passed. Um, but she was quite young, so it was the same. She was really nice. Uh, she told me uh, about certain after-school clubs that would do acting and or musicals, and um, and so I ended up joining an after-school club in Epsom. It was uh, youth theatre workshops and going there and not really enjoying the musical side of things. Mm. I don't particularly, I can hold a tune, but I don't really have a singing, singing voice. Um, but enjoying the dancing and enjoying the acting and enjoying the comedy. Yeah. And again, it was just another role of getting a kick out of making people laugh, being, being stupid, being foolish and performing and playing. And then also at the same time, then developing my craft and going, oh, I like the idea of being a method actor. That sounds really cool. Yeah, as a kid, whenever I play a role, I'd literally go all in because it was an attraction. It was, it was, it was a good test for me, I think. And 
again, doing drama and then learning the other side of drama where it's not just comedy. You, there's some serious plays out there. So in year 10 or year, a GCSE play was a play called The Normal Heart, which was about the AIDS epidemic in New York in the 80s. And I, that was the first time I ever multi rolled I played maybe four characters. Mm -hmm. And I learned then to be very distinct in my characterization. And so now I'm learning my craft a little bit more. Coupled with being on stage every every three or four months because you'd have a quarter, you do a you do a musical, um, and that was when I was able to like do my comedy, uh, and then at school it was more like actual a little bit more serious topics. So uh, our in year eleven and twelve we did a we wrote a uh, what was it of a basin piece about Zimbabwe and Robert Mugabe, and so learning and that was. And then we also did a show called Black Watch, which was about the atrocities that happened in an uh, army base in England, uh, which we won't get into, but you can look at Black Watch and all what happened there as well. And doing those plays and then learning that theatre wasn't just about um, making people laugh or being a performer, but actually telling true stories and giving people an, a reenactment of things that have happened yeah. and how powerful theatre could be. And then through that, learning about uh, Martin McDonough, who I think is a, a fucking brilliant playwright. Um, and a, writes really good movies as well. So he's the one that wrote about Seven Psychopaths and In Bruges, which is a fucking banging film. It's so good. Yeah. So those kind of plays, right? So yeah. yeah. Free Bill yes. you wrote as well, which is a fucking masterpiece. It's, yes, that's a brilliant film. Yeah, being in, being in high school and doing the... First of all, I thought it was hilarious because my teacher who was not Mrs. Powell at that point. It was a lady called um, Amanda McElwain. Shout out to Miss, Miss Mac. Um, she was like, she was so, so eccentric. Northern Irish, uh, was in Ireland with, about, with the Troubles and was very much about teaching us about those kind of things as well. And learning about the Troubles and all the kind of stuff, which is so Irish to call. Um, I was so, I always find it ironically hilarious when they'd call you know, really pretty much civil war, <laughs> the troubles. It's so, it's so, <laughs> it's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. It's just, yeah. I don't even know if it's funny. It's not a funny situation, yeah. but it's uh, such a f fucking hilarious name to me. Yeah. Cause oh, it's just, it's just, it's just the troubles. I was yeah. like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. It's, 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 it's uh, anyway, it's not a funny situation. Cause I remember, I remember, um, we had like a really tall ladder and for some reason, like it was just unstable and it fell, but it made out of nowhere. It had, this was, this was when I knew PTSD was a thing. Yeah. The ladder fell and it made the biggest crash, but it yeah. crashed directly behind her as she was telling us. And she, I've never seen someone just drop to the floor and just go into a feet position like, and she, it was like she was back there. Wow. And obviously as a, as a child, you're maybe 15, 16, you're going, what do you do? This is your yeah. teacher, what do you do? And some of the boys started laughing. And I was like, this is not funny because she's actually in- it, it might be like just, you know, nervous, nervous reaction. Nervous yeah. reaction, yeah. right? Um, but just going over there and just like, this is when I realized I had a caring bone in my body, just going there and being in, in her face and going, hey, Mrs. Okay, being, mm -hmm look, it's okay. And she like getting her to breathe because she was like, and I remember her coming out of it and like immediately just going, it's not funny to the boys that were mm -hmm. laughing. And I was like, it was, you, she was like, you don't know what flashed through her head, yeah. which was bombs going off behind her, <sighs> you know? Um, but then, so that put another element of Martin Madonna on me and learning about Lieutenant of Anishmore and, and going, doing those plays. But the reason why, Going back to the Lieutenant, why have I on it? Oh yeah, because she said, oh, we're going to do some black comedy now. And I was like, oh shit, we're doing Eddie Murphy. <laughs> oh shit, okay, cool. So we're going to get Eddie Murphy. We're going to do like, at the time, um, at the time Chris Rock, Chris Rock was big. He just done bigger, black and better at the time as well. So that was out. And I was like, oh shit, we're going to do some black comedy. Sit, sit, sit. And then the next week she comes in with Lieutenant Vanishmore and reading it like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> what is this Irish thing? What's going on here? Uh, and then, but then falling in love with that and going to university and putting in the fact that I wanted to do law 
and getting all the way up till almost my exams, still having a law, having done, having gone down to like Exeter and all these other big universities and wanting to do law, wanting to do law, wanting to do law and then changing it. Mm. I speaking to my dad and go, dad, I don't want to do law. I don't want to do it. I want to do, I want to do drama. If I don't do, if I do law, I think I might drop out. Yeah. I remember saying to him, I know it's going to be a tough life, but I kind of, idealistically, um, I wanted to be happy and I wanted to do something that I found fulfilling, no matter how tough it was and no matter how little money I have. Stupid decision now. (laughs) But I think only stupid in the sense of, um, I wish I had done something at uni to not as a plan B, but something to give myself a different degree. Do you know what I mean? So like having drama, but then doing drama and, and creative writing or drama and uh, psychology, because I love psychology. I love the psychology of it all. Or drama and philosophy or something, something yeah. that would just give me a, a diversity. Uh, the, yeah, diversity in my view, or the, the more diversification. I don't know if that's a word. I just made it up. It could be. Because um, there is someone who loves words and loves reading. Um, um, I wish I'd done something else just to supplement that a little bit yeah. more. But I knew going into university, knowing that I didn't want to go to drama school. I didn't want to go to drama school yeah. um, for obvious reasons, um, which obviously came out when a couple of four years ago, when we had four years when George Floyd was brutally, brutally murdered on the streets, um, on the hard streets of oh, fucking hell. Don't make that joke, mate. Um, <laughs> uh, and then certain drama schools, uh, and I don't need to put them on blast because they know, uh, try to like talk about how they love their black students and all the black students going, fuck off. No, you don't. This is what's happened on us. Mm. You know, you haven't, you didn't let us in. You thought we'd bring out the, the, the lower quality of, of, teaching and we were just there to make up the numbers kind of thing so i knew going into university even like way back when i'm not going to say the year um <laughs> late late uh 2000s early 2010s um knowing not wanting to do drama school and knowing i didn't want to do lambda and i didn't want to do central i didn't want to do that because i didn't trust yeah i didn't trust that they would cater for me or cater to me and knowing that university was the route that I had to go through if I wanted to do further education. Obviously being a child of, I would say an immigrant because my mom came over here in 1969. She was born in Jamaica. Um, knowing that it wasn't an option to not go to university as well. Mm. It's not an option. You have to go. Yeah. You have to go. Yeah. And so going to university, doing drama, and going to Kingston University and I'll just say shout out to Kingston all the lecturers there um, because it was a lot of theory and a lot of practical stuff as well. Um, I wish it was more practical. Mm. However, I think that they, although they didn't set us up for the understanding of the industry and that's been a culture shock as I've been progressing my career, they did give me a great foundation in understanding the different types of theatre, the different types of film, and giving you a little bit more space of knowing what you wanted to go into. Um, there are still a few people in my course who are either acting or in the acting industry. I you know one of my really good friends, she's now a lecturer up in Edinburgh, um, shout out Sophia Naku. Um, but I really knew going into university, I wanted to do something to do with the arts. Mm. Um, and. I would say that went all the way back to being a kid and loving to make people laugh, loving to take a risk and knowing where to channel my energy and how. I finished uni. I went into work. I was doing this just generic work at the time. I was straddling both the theatre or the acting and um, just trying to work. And I think I was about 24 and I was just like, I've not pursued my acting career Mm. as much as I wanted to. And so from there I went into identity. 
Yeah. I think if you're in London, I think everyone's gone through that route. At least, like, if you, you know, especially if you're a bit older <laughs> and you yeah. kind of like you have a job and you're mm-hmm. trying to do it part time. Yeah. Ironically, though, and this is a funny thing. I don't. It's not. It's not thing. Ironically, though, when I was, I had the option because identity, I think, had just even opened up, and so there was something about identity when I was 18, and it being like a, a school for black actors who are on the privileged actors. And me looking at it intently and kind of going, huh, I'll go to uni instead. And I, I reckon I would have maybe have been around the same era as like the likes of Tish, right? And, and Boyega and all those always really big successful people. Yeah. I don't regret my decision, but it was just, just a nice little funny anecdote that like that was something I was looking at. It was the only acting school that I was interested in. Mm-hmm. And the only reason why is because I was like, there'd be black people there. And I feel that they look after me. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Uh, but I went to uni route and um, I really enjoyed that. I was mm. able to do some really, I, wrote, I remember writing collaboratively, collaboratively um, with a theatre company that we set up out, just out of uni. It was four of us. It was called Rooster Theatre Company. It was myself, Laura and Alex. And... Um, being able to like go to Edinburgh French and just doing Harold Pinter, doing three, three back-to-back Harold Pinter plays. Heavy shit. But um, I think that made me a better actor than going back as Rooster and writing, having written her own play. Um, which was just about like media and how the media is very corrupt. Uh, but on the, on the guise of like two homeless people uh, to try and capitalize on, on trying to get more money and you know, the begging on the street wasn't uh, working. It was to like start their own street um, newspaper and how the power of the media and how if they could tell certain stories from a certain angle, they would get more and more money. Mm. They were still homeless, but they were like, they themselves got corrupted because of how much um, uh, money they were getting. And they, they ended up like realizing that they were maybe thinking that they were better than any of the homeless people that they were around. And just started going on attack against homeless people. And then everyone just went, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the end of the play, we're just, de- we're des- just destitute again. Mm. But we, we took that play to Greece. Uh, and we spoke in or our, ang- our language, English. And the audience, um, we kind of changed it because I'm just remembering now again, we kind of changed it in terms of, uh, it was just, I don't know, if, don't know if you remember, it was so much in the newspapers about how immigrants and people on the small boats still now, this is how far back it goes. This was before Brexit. Yeah. Um, how bad immigrants are, this, that, and the other, the coming in on these boats, taking our jobs. Uh, and then, I don't know if you remember, there was a, the, the time where the small child, the toddler, I remember that, yes. washed up on the beach and yeah. overnight for about a week and a half, even the Daily Mail changed their tune and how it's like, oh, these poor kids and how these poor immigrants and we should be looking after them, this, that and the other. And it was, it was the most, the kid dying was sad. More than sad, it was fucking it's tragic. It's just tragic. Yeah. But the way the newspaper and the way people's information, their outlook got influenced overnight. One, obviously, by the child. But two, for the next week, the newspapers, all those right wing and newspapers, actually for a week and a bit, being on the side of immigrants. I don't know if people remember that. But if you do, and if you haven't, go back and look. I can't remember the exact time and we were editing the script and we went out to Greece and I was like, we are going to, and this is quite traumatic and maybe we, maybe we should have done it. Maybe we shouldn't. I don't know. Um, just to emphasize the point of what we're trying to say about the media and how you cannot trust it. We bought the same clothes that a kid was wearing and we stuffed newspapers in it and we stuck it outside the door and you had if you had to leave the theatre, you had to step over that child. Just, Whoa. you had to. And it was, the audience were just, they couldn't understand everything, but they understood. And for me, that's what I was, I was so indignant 
about that. And maybe it was Shabana wasn't it wasn't me capitalizing on a child's death. Yeah. Or us capitalizing on a child's death. It wasn't because we that wasn't about it. It was about just to emphasize the point. Hmm. Two weeks ago, these newspapers were going on and on about how immigrants are bad, and they are still now. Yeah. And now the politicians are doing it. And now again, riots are all about England. But for two weeks, mm. they weren't. And everyone's mindset changed. Yeah. Everyone who's going on about immigrants now and everyone who was tor tor torching this country and burning it down for two weeks, because the newspapers said so, mm. they were this way. And that, that is, for me, the power of theatre. Yeah. Theatre is supposed to sometimes theatre and film and art, art is meant to reflect. Mm -hmm. so yes, it's meant to be an escape. It's meant to be an escape, but also it's some of the most powerful tools we can talk about to reflect the times that we're living. Yeah. And that's coming from Greek. It's mm -hmm. coming from Greece. It's coming from Greek choral fucking, you know, traditions and that kind of stuff. But anyway. <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you completely. It just like it, it, it does mean like that's all all that theater should do. Theater but it could be like yeah, theater could be an escape. Yeah. Escape, but like art obviously always reflects mm -hmm. the reality that we live in, and uh, it should like you should use this platform if you have what to say. If you have we have someone to say, say, then it. say it. Say yes, it. The, say it. But at the same time, I think like if you don't, just trying to take the check boxes doesn't work. It's just it's not a problem that like, I think right now it happens a lot. There's a lot of, uh, it's an interesting, it's, it's interesting you say, but I think, I think this industry has a lot of, so there's two ways you can see it. There's either, again, I'm, 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 I'm framing it in a binary way, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know whether, I think it can be more nuanced than that. I think there is a good, if they're doing a good thing by having a lot more diversity, diversity yeah. on camera, yeah. but you can tell when there's not diversity behind the camera. Yeah. And you can tell when there's not diversity in the rooms that are making the decisions. And if there's more diversity in rooms that are making the decisions, then you're the, 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 the diversity that you see on, on the camera and on the stage and on uh, your YouTubes and your other platforms, it will come across. Yeah. It will come across. Um, and so very good job in bringing diversity in front of people, have more of a diversity behind the camera as well. I'm very much a believer in equal opportunity. Yeah. And I think that's very important. I think when you, I didn't know I was going to touch on this. Um, well, you see in recent things like with Supercell, that's on Netflix. Uh, I still haven't watched it. Which so is, I you know, watch I've this. watched a couple of episodes and <laughs> I'm going to watch it. So I'm going to watch yeah. it more. I need to like finish the entire thing. I'm just <laughs> waiting because I need, I, I kind of want to binge it. It's one of those things I want to binge. But you go back from, you know, you go back even further to I May Destroy You, for example. I haven't watched it. I don't know what it is. You have to. Yeah. You have to. Someone like Michaela Cole, who's, a genius, in my opinion, a genius um, in her craft. Um, if you look at America, someone like Donald Glover, I think is a genius in his craft. Um, you can bring it back to England, you've got someone like Ratman now, who's just a genius in the stories that he wants to tell. When you give people opportunity, mm -hmm. magic happens. Yeah. And I don't think that an opportunity takes away from other people. I think if you try and just do it as a tick box, either way, it doesn't work. Just give people the opportunity. And sometimes it falls flat on its face. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you create gold. Yeah. And that's all this industry, this industry projects itself to be a leader of um, Progr progress. Progression. Yes. But. A criticism, and I think a fair criticism of the industry is it doesn't always practice what it preaches. Or if it does, it does it as a consequence for someone else. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, I don't believe there's a finite number of opportunities. I don't believe in that. I think there is an infinite number of opportunities. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what you measure your success to be. But 
just give people more opportunity. And maybe, again, maybe that's an idealistic way because money is involved as well. I, under, I understand it's a, it's a business at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, but, but good stories, good, but good stories, stories always, like, they, always. They, they, they will make money. They like should make. Bad they should stories make money. with tick boxes don't make money. Bad story, like it's just like just make a good story. Well, sometimes, yeah, that's it. Sometimes you, sometimes if you've got a good story, you, this is this is the other side to it because I see it on both sides. Sometimes the uh, the good story needs to have the boxes ticked mm -hmm. for it to be even produced or even to be yeah. put out there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you can counteract that by just giving more people an opportunity or having more eyes on it or again having more diversity behind the camera in the rooms who are making mm -hmm. the decisions you can tell you can tell when certain people are writing for a different culture yeah you know course, yeah you yeah. can tell you I can mean, tell like it just no, from the like words they the say the thing is like you all the scenarios they're in i do believe you <laughs> can write for different culture you just need to do your fucking research you, you, your need, to, you, need, to you research. need to do a lot of research you need to speak to people you need to understand and then you can write mm. of course like yeah. anyone can write like it's 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 it's, it's a profession <laughs> you need to know how to do you it need to know. but of course it's better like to find real people with real stories and just add it to kind of to to, to your final product that's that's my take on it yeah that's my take on it i don't think i don't I've always said this, um, I speak for myself. I am very much open to changing my mind and changing my opinion. If someone makes a valid argument or I'm more educated in a certain thing. Where I am and my experiences today mm -hmm. leads me to believe and conclude what I've just said. Yeah. I could be right, I could be wrong. I don't no whether right or wrong is the right argument i just think we need to try and be fairer and i think this industry if it talks about being progressive yeah then it needs to put its money where its mouth is yeah. it's all well and good showing the diversity and being inclusive i think that's important uh for example if you're doing a show for deaf people for example then hire deaf actors <laughs> Don't just put sign language in mm. or put, um, uh, what do you call it, auto caption on, on screens or something mm. like that. Hire deaf actors. Mm. Hire deaf actors. I'm just curious how many, how many are there? Like, I'm pretty sure. You would be surprised. Yeah. I'm, they, I'm, you'd be surprised. Because no, I, I honestly there's don't so know. so many. <laughs> but that's just one example. And I'm only saying that because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn BSL. I just have very undisciplined mm. in it. But I being friends with people who do know it and being friends with having a girlfriend who is learning it right now yeah. um it kind of puts you in a space for other people do you know what i mean mm. and that's just one of the examples i can give do, do you think like uh, from, from your perspective there are more opportunities now for for people of different like non-white people <laughs> because everyone talks about like creating more and more opportunities is it reality or not i think yes but as I said, I think it's predominantly show. On show. And there's nothing wrong with on show as long as you're putting your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And I will, as I said, I'm just going to repeat myself, which is I'm just going to go back to, it's great for people like me. Um, but I also think it needs to be reflected behind as well. And mm. at the moment, I don't think it is reflected mm. for people behind the cameras. I think we've still got waves and waves and waves and waves to do that. Yeah. I don't think that's hard. But why, that like, comes why, with why does it happen? I'm just curious because it's... <sighs> we, live in an, we, live, we now live in an era where everything is on show. We now, even with this podcast, either we're listening or watching, uh, we now live in an era where everyone is on show. We are so... Social media is so strong and so in influential that people can't not show diversity. You have to show. Mm. You have to. That's why there are boxes being ticked. You have to show it because that is the time we're living in. We're living in a time where the world is so much smaller. Yeah. And but the world is so much smaller. People are so much more alienated. It's really sad, um, um, in my opinion. Uh, however. Maybe the anti-fascist demonstrations contradict what I just said. So I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we live in a social media environment, and so there's so much more you have to show that you're doing, and that gives you 
space and time. If I'm being, if I'm being uh, nice about it, I think it gives you time to then correct stuff behind the scenes. Yeah. You can't not show it. Mm. You have to. Mm. My whole thing is, you're showing it, now be, be about it behind the screen. Yeah. Or be about it in the room, people who are making the decisions. And that comes from just giving people an opportunity to show what they're about. Mm. But then you have to have the right people in the right places to show that, you know? And so it just, it just needs a lot of work and needs a lot of movement and needs a lot more investment. Yeah. And that is, I think that maybe is a government policy, maybe. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe the government uh, needs to give more to the arts. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it does. Because when lockdown happened, all you had was arts. Mm. All you had was people and creatives who are out of work, writing stories. Yeah. Creating stuff on YouTube, creating stuff, uh, you know, on, on, on other social media platforms and entertaining people, partly because they were bored yeah. and partly because that's what people needed, you know? So maybe give back, maybe, maybe Keir Starmer, uh, <laughs> and whoever's the, the culture secretary or whatever, I don't know who it is. Maybe you need to get more to the arts. Maybe, maybe, maybe just maybe core subjects are important. Obviously they are, but the people that are the creators, the people that are bust their ass every day and, and their purpose for living is to create, need and a bit more help. to entertain you. And to entertain, well. need a bit more, yeah. you know, need a bit more dollar dollar, a little <laughs> pounds pounds, need a bit more moolah moolah, do you know what I mean? And then maybe, maybe that will help. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's a constant, it's a vicious cycle. Um, I think equal opportunity is important. I think equal outcomes, Mm. 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 I see it from both sides. I see it from both sides. <laughs> I feel like Donald Trump when I say that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm not going to do an impression of, of Agent Orange. Uh, Can not, you? No. I can't. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We're not going there. Um. <laughs> so have, have you toured a lot with theatre? Like, mm -hmm. uh, um, I've done. I've done two tours, uh, I've done like two tours tours. Yeah. Uh, like around England. And then I did a third tour more as like a tour manager role with a great company called Three Inch Fools. who predominantly do like musical Shakespeare, like Shakespeare music and instruments and that kind of stuff. But that was, that's, that was a real, real fun experience. Yeah. The second time around. Yeah. The second time around was real fun. The first time around wasn't fun all the time for me. Yeah. That's not the tour's fault. That's the world. <laughs> multiple of people's yeah. fault, you know? Yeah. Maybe including mine. Maybe if I was a bit more open, uh, yeah. maybe I wouldn't have felt so lonely. But, but the good thing about that is that um, those actors who were on tour with me um, are like family mm. to me now, do you know? I had never been on tour. Tour life is fun and it's grueling. So yeah. tour life is you get up, it, you get you get you kind of get one day off a week. Mm. You're working six days a week. You are getting to a venue early. It's mainly outdoor touring yeah. uh, that I did. You build a stage. Yeah. You it gets, it's going back to like the King's Chamber, the Men of Shakespearean times, and the Shakespearean times or whatever. Um, and even before that, where we rock up to a place, set up a stage do the acting, drink until the morning, go to sleep, <laughs> get up, get up around 10 o'clock the next day, go into another location, do the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, it is great. It is tiring. You get zero sleep. And I think in my mid to late twenties, I was for it. And now I'm reaching or have reached the big three O and then some, uh, it's not for me now. I'm very much, I'm now, I'm now a bougie motherfucker <laughs> where I'm like, I love the idea of touring, but let me do the inside touring. So I don't have to build anything. <laughs> I can just go on stage, do my, do my sound yeah. check and then go and be in the comfort of a very warm, <laughs> a green room and have kettle and all these facilities and have nice hot food and not some days not knowing where you're mm. going to sleep. And sometimes yeah. you're sleeping in a, um, in a garage <laughs> on, a, on a sleeping bed. 
<laughs> some days if you've got the budget that week you can you can you know splash out on a hotel yeah. um, <laughs> how, like how, how many how many shows did you do maximum for one we one tour we were doing mid may to like mid to the end of september we clocked out over 100 shows yeah over 100 how, shows like, was it still fresh acting like, wise for me i again i try i rate my work i think on how on how much i've improved or how much it's subjective um i think for me it made me quicker yeah. as an actor yeah because i wasn't a big fan of doing the same show twice mm-hmm. not the lines but how how you embody the character as you're doing it and how you're interacting with the audience because it's great to interact with the audience and so i i tried to i made an active choice of never doing the never trying to to deliver the same line twice um but also at the same time trying to keep it authentic Mm -hmm. and trying to keep it true to the moment yeah and i I then learned that actually being true to the moment is more important than trying to um artificially create something reinvent reinvent just just for the sake of reinvention yeah yeah, yeah. so so what was it the uh, deny nothing invent nothing by moment no deny nothing except everything i don't know no, no it's basically like don't try to invent something in the moment but don't deny the impulse to yeah do something there we go yeah yeah, yeah 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 yes yes thank you don't create anything for the sake of creating it but yeah. also don't deny what's there yeah and i think that made me i think that's making me and that attitude is making me a a better actor yeah um i'm very much someone i think i can't remember who said it to me and someone said I'm, i i like to give people space to act and i think that's true i think again it's a preoccupation of not being a spotlight hogger mm-hmm. which is i sometimes i think to my detriment um and i'm working better on that I, but i do like to celebrate the people who i'm working with yeah and sometimes the celebration tends makes me sit back mm. a lot and then I have to like be back on the front foot so I'm learning I'm learning how to be better at that um I don't think it's about being selfish I just think it's about being again being more being more in tune with the scene and what's going on yeah. rather than sitting back and going hey are you doing a really good job I like this because I don't <laughs> think I don't I don't do it in a patronizing way I do it in a way of I love working with who I'm working with yeah and so I want to see you explode. I want to mm. see you, I want to see you do your thing. But um that doesn't work when you're on set. What doesn't really work? Well maybe it works maybe it's it's good in class, maybe you know giving people that confidence or you know I'm when I'm in a when I'm not in an acting role or if I'm in a directing role um I I think one of my Gifts is a is a self indulgent word, but it's the only word that's coming to my brain now. I think one of the things I have is I know what people need. Mm-hmm. I think at that moment, not all the time, but in that moment, I feel like I know what people need to get whatever it is they they're trying to get. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, and so, but sometimes that comes in through my acting as well. If you would have to choose between uh, theater and screen. So my cynical answer is film because I think that uh, it you can achieve, you can get to a wider audience. Yes. Uh, you can branch out so much more. My love and my first love in this industry has, and I think will always be theater. I don't think, for me, I don't think you can replace the feeling of uh, live interaction. It is a communion. It is a communion with yourself, the other actors, but also the audience as well. Mm-hmm. And I am very much a break the fourth wall kind of actor. Mm-hmm. I I am disciplined. I can keep the fourth wall up, but I don't. I I you can't tell me to switch off that there's people there. I'm also not going to play to that, but I can do that if I yeah. if I can have that. I have that in me. Um, but theatre is. And I think I think for a lot of actors, actually, I think theatre is you have to be in the moment. Yeah, it is when you're in the moment. It is. I don't know if you've had this. You ever been on stage and you're just halfway through a play, and then all of a sudden you're aware that you're in a play. 
you're just swimming through, you're just swanning all the way through. You're like, it's, you're there, you're on stage, you're doing your scene. Yeah, and then halfway through the scene, something just goes, boop, and you go, ah, oh, uh, 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 uh. And I hate that because it takes me out of it. But um, yeah. yeah, it's really scary. It's a really scary thing. But when you don't have that moment um, and you don't know what you've done, you've just been like, yeah. if, if the play was a body, like a human body, you were just swimming in the bloodstream of it. You were yeah. part of the nervous system. You were, you were just there. You, something comes yeah. over. You can get that effect in film. I think of some of the best actors do have that effect in film and, or, or give the illusion that they have that effect. But I think to do it on a stage it's is easy, a completely it's different to get there. thing. Yeah, it's, easy, sure. it's easy to get there. It's harder to stay there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you only get that chance once. Mm. Well, th this night. <laughs> this, well, this, this Next night. Next night, you'll have this another night, chance. This night, but, but yeah. that goes to my philosophy of this is the only play I've done. Yeah, yeah, of course. This is the only time I've done this play. This yeah. is the first time I've spoken uh, these words. These are the first times I'm speaking these words to this character mm -hmm. or to this particular audience. But also, actually, unless it's, you're not going to get the exact same audience every night. Yeah. For example, when we did, from working at the studio, Lee, who's been in the show already, he wrote a play called Stretch Marks and Broken Hearts and we put it on yes, the Yes, I watched it. It was great. And we did, I think, a four or five night run. Every night was different. And every night, you could almost, like the way, and I remember, I remember doing this, and I think all of us did it, almost kind of like just angling our framing of the character depending on which way it swung. Huh. The first night, Lee's character who was like a really broody character was the comedic god mm -hmm. and lee framed his character like the way he kind of pitched for lines he was working with it and i think that's a really good actor yeah. um he was working with the audience he was giving the audience like a clown show which yeah. is one of my favorite um uh lessons i did and and stuff i did at, at uni was clowning uh it was a case of you give the audience what they want until they're bored of it yeah and then you change Hmm. And if they're not bored of it, you carry on. And I think that, that lesson from clowning really helped me as well. But that's the thing, like, because in, in this context, you still have to stay in the mm. scene, in the object, in the, logic, in the logic of what is on paper. Yes. What's like, yeah. And, but at the same time, you kind of angle it like in a but way also, that... But also... To also, the mood of the audience? Yes and no, because I think... And again, we, we've, we've, we know this. Um, not, we don't know this maybe to be true, maybe not to be true. The, the, the script is doing one thing. Your job is to yeah. do exactly what's on the page. Your job is to bring yourself to it. Yeah. So if the script is doing one thing and you're just doing what the script is, it becomes one dimensional. Yeah. But if you're doing what, the, and this is again what Lee but is But still, like, there, there, there still is logic you in the script. Still, you, you have you, to respect you, the you writing. Can't, yeah, you yeah. can't, it can't be jarring. Again, yeah. so that is going back to um, creating and fabricating something. You still have to, in my opinion, you still have to stick to the script and what it says, but you don't have to do what the script says. Yeah. Right? It's, it's like that, it's a, it's a nuance of here's the story. You have, you know where you got to go. You got to get from A to B. You can't be jarring for the audience, but at the same time, you kind of want to give the audience what they want or give them a little sense of satisfaction or also um, switch it slightly, but still not let it be jarring. Mm -hmm. First night, Lee was a comedy guy. Second night, I was a comedy guy. Third night, it was like Miranda's character was, my character was hated the third night. Mm -hmm. They hated my character. Really? Like I was public enemy number one. Yeah. And I, I kind of angled it to that. I kept it because it didn't, it, it kind of followed the theme. But I, you kind of give it what you want. I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not the guy they're going to laugh at tonight. Maybe it's how I was feeling. Yeah. Maybe it was the audience. Maybe it was both. Maybe it was just something. But on the night, it was a completely different play to the night before. Mm. It was a completely different play to the first night. In my opinion, I think that is the mark of a good play mm. or the mark of, to pat myself on the back, I think that's what you're, I think that's maybe what you're aiming for. I don't want to be in a play that is like McDonald's. I don't want to be in a play where every <laughs> store you go to, you get the exact same thing. Now, that is a beauty of the McDonald's market because they know you're going to get consistency. Yeah. I think for an actor, you don't want to, you want to be consistency, consistently in the moment or consistently aiming for that. I don't think you want to be consistently doing the exact same thing 
On film, it is completely different. Yeah. On film, you want that consistency. On film, you, you kind of... Yeah, I think... I think oh, I, but if you're a script supervisor, you want that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like, in, in, like in, if you talk about continuity, like, about, like, doing the same kind of gesture, like, or whatever. On Yes, but at the same time, I remember, like, who, who was it? Uh, Fincher? Who was asking people, like, to do, like, 70 takes or whatever? Mm -hmm. And you think, like, well... I mean, yeah, you, in that, in that you, scenario, yeah. He, he wouldn't want them to do 70 takes that exactly, exactly the same. The same. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you're yeah. right in that respect. Yeah. You are right in that respect. Yes. Yes. I think if you want, if you're like looking for the shot, then you yeah. want that. Yeah. If you want to be free in writing, then yes, mm. there's a difference. But yeah, I find, I find theatre so much more freeing. Mm. Um, always and have, it's just always like, it's just like immediate feedback from, from the audience that oh, you like. So when you're doing film, like screen acting, you sometimes will never get any feedback. For me, is I find film less satisfying, and I think I, I think I think it's because I need to do a little bit more. I want to do I want to do a lot more of it anyway. Yeah. I find it less satisfying from a selfish, um, self-centered, wanting to be in the spotlight perspective because I know but I am not the be all or end all I am the third stage in a 50 stage um, machine yeah. I've done my job it's now going into color it's going into sound it's going into editing it's going into what the producer wants mm -hmm. it's going into this that and the other it's going to so many different avenues that my job is what's shown mm -hmm. but it's I think the success of a good film or a TV also comes down to the editing. Oh, whereas, yes. whereas, as you know, because you're a podcast, you're doing a podcast now. Congratulations. <laughs> whereas theatre, selfishly, the performer, the performer side of me is I can go on stage and there is a uh, Machiavellian part of me that goes, I can do whatever I want yeah. in this moment. And you can't stop me. You can't stop me because I'm on stage right now. I can take it left. I can take it right. I can do whatever. Do you though? Oh no, but there's an element that you always could. Yeah. I remember being uh, my first <laughs> my first time going to Edinburgh. We were doing this play and it got canned and I need to show you the reviews. I don't have it on me right now, but I think the reviews was um, this production has never left the school gates. Um, so you need to tell the director that um, symbolism isn't a synonym for shit or something along those lines. <laughs> so symbolism isn't a synonym for shit, which is, which is my favorite line. It's not what they said, but yeah. it was the F that was the essence. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> but then also I got mentioned and um, my friend Jim, uh, got like mention of being really, really good. <laughs> it was good right. in it. But one of the other actors, they were meant to play like a father figure for me. And um, they were meant to be quite stern. And one day, they just came through the door and was like, going, hey, how you doing? Da, 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 da. But you're meant to be the bad guy, but it's not me, the black guy, in a towel <laughs> for all my life. Yeah. You can't come onto stage with the energy of um, fucking Cameron from Modern Family. <laughs> you, 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 can't, you can't do that. So that's, that's, that's like the Machiavellian side of it going, mm, you can do that, but don't. <laughs> You know, because now that's jarring. That's straight. That's fabrication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's jarring. And I'm, I'm criticizing that actor, yeah. which I really probably shouldn't. But it was an anecdote. How, how do you prepare? How do you prepare for, for the, for the role, for the scene? Do you have like your own routine? Panic. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the first reaction. Fear. <laughs> Lie down. A lot of, a lot of just focusing on my breath. <laughs> um, um, I've, I would say in the past two years, my method has changed. I, so it's not answering your question, but it's understanding who I am as an actor. I would say, and I say this more now, and I've become more accepting of it now that I would, I'm a more of a character actor than I am anything else. I love exploring the psychology of different roles. I love psych I love exploring. And it's probably because of I delved, delved into the method as a child um, and growing up as a child, you know, but child prodigy, as you say. Um, um, 
I'm aware that I can't go into a role and not consider who the character is. Mm. I know some people are able to. I'm trying, and I don't, I'm trying more and more to bring my humor, my personality. Bear, bear it in mind, you probably haven't seen me do a lot of comedy roles. Not a lot, no. Whereas when I started out, it was pure comedy. Mm. I love comedy. I love it, I love it, I love yeah. it. Um, I think being a stand-up comedian is one of the hardest things you can ever do because you, you have to be in the moment. You have to read the room. And when a comedian bombs, it's because they've not read the room. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. I could never do it. And kudos to anyone who does. And the best comedians, you're amazing. Like they're gifts to the world. Mm. Um, but they also bombed a lot. They also bombed a lot. <laughs> um, but I, for me, I can't help but being a character. And so if I'm preparing for a role, I think it's one of the first, I don't really go into how they walk and how they talk and this. I, I just, I feel like I go into who they are, but then also who I, how I relate to them. And is there something in me, if it's a villain, for example, is there something, is there somewhere or a part of me that I can, is there a possibility that I can go into that role. And I think, yes, there, there is. I don't need to. Mm. I don't need to. That's psychotic, isn't it? Fuck. <laughs> I don't need to, but I know that there's, there's a element of, there could be an element of me in a certain scenario where I can do, or I can be, I can envision myself in a scenario of what the character is going through. Yeah. And from there, that's my start point. Mm. That is my start point. And from there, if I can do that, and if I can imagine it, and if I can do that in a non-judgmental way, because it is a fabrication, it is not real. That's one of the things. So I think that's why every form of teaching has its place. As long as we understand that it is not real, it is a make-believe. We are at the end of the day doing what we did as children, which was playing make-believe, right? That's why we're called players back in the day. We are playing. Mm -hmm. We are on stage and we are playing. I've we never are on been set. Player. Never been <laughs> <laughs> we are we are we are essentially players. We yeah. that's what we are. Uh, players have their parts. It's a Shakespeare line. Um all the players, all the world on stage, all the players have their parts for certain. Yeah, I'm not gonna do the full quote. Um because I messed it up already. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as you understand you're playing, it is not real, it is not that deep. Mm -hmm. You are Sometimes maybe in a show or in a play that is deep, but it is not real. Yeah. And that's as far as I can go. If I then embody it that it's real and I invest that deeply into it, I kind of, there's an art in it. There's certain people who, who are able to go there and I have been there and it broke me. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yes, I have been there. I have gone to, I will make, I will embody this role so much. Um, and it fucked me. Tell me really, more about that. I mean, a, a light example would be, uh, I've, got, I've got two examples. Um, and this, I'm not going to say the class it was in. I'm not going to say uh, where it happened. People that were there were there and they know. Um, we. This is one of the first examples. One of the teachers, they got us to split the... Uh, our page, the A4 page into four, and almost like just list certain things about ourselves. And uh, the next week we had to prepare um, a really important life-defining moment of our lives. And a lot of people brought in life-defining moments of their lives, which unfortunately for a lot of creatives is quite traumatic. Mm -hmm. And one of the feedbacks they gave was to, to one of the actors was, well, that's not really enough, you need to go deeper kind of thing. And it's like, well, no, because who are you then to say that this traumatic experience in this person's life that you have asked for, one, isn't entertaining enough, two, isn't real enough. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of actors go into drink and drugs and that kind of stuff because they need a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you're, you're asking us to go to places that maybe we haven't healed from, or you're asking us to delve into places for the sake of other people's entertainment that um, is traumatic. 
I don't think it's happening a lot now. And if it, because we're not, there's no aftercare. It, I don't think it'd be fine, but it'd be better if there was aftercare. And so me going back to me, what happened in uni was I did, I can't remember what the player was, it was Ghost, but I had to, I think it was Ghosts. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. But I was asked to, uh, if you're not a real actor, you're not going to be able to portray this part if you don't drink a bottle of whiskey the night before, like a bottle of whiskey the night before you, you go on stage and like just pour your heart out over this bottle. Mm-hmm. And doesn't that's, sound that's healthy. A, it's not healthy. It's At not all. sustainable. No, it's not sustainable. You could probably get a really good performance, but that person's going to be broken for years. And so I know my. I now know my limit. I now know that what I don't want to do. I don't want to put myself into a situation where. And that is real, by the way. That's actually what happened. I'm not making that up. Um, and I think my feedback was, yeah, you kind of, you kind of hit the marks, but um, I didn't see the torture. I wanted you to bring a real, real pain. And I was like, dude, I am 20 years old. I am in uni. I am still trying to figure out what I want to do, who I am, where I want to go. And, you know, some people have real, real torture. Some people don't, but some people do. And this is not like the torture or PTSD Olympics. Um, what's torture to you and what's pain for you is what's pain for you and it's real to you, mm-hmm. right? Asking kids and adults uh, that the only real emotion is crying and giving people the award for crying the most authentically because yeah, it's a really great reason for emotion. Like laughter isn't an emotion. Yeah, shit. You know, it's shit emotion. Like, it about that, do you know right? what I mean? <laughs> I don't think I've answered your question, but I think it's because I think it's quite. It's it's murky waters. It's murky waters. I think for me, my prep is I know my limit. Yeah, I know where I would like to go, and if you want me to go any further, then I, as a person, I may get over this at some point. But I, as a person, need to feel. I, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a good thing. I don't know. It's just a comment of of where I am at this moment in my life right now. Mm. At this moment in my life, if I can go, it, I can go to a point, and I can go beyond that point. But I one needs to mentally men, mentally prepare myself, and two, I need to. I think at this moment, I need to be in an environment that's going to be supportive mm-hmm. and be helpful yeah. and be you know, um, encouraging. And once that camera is off or once the curtains are closed, that comradeship, I think I need that at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because I know back in second year of uni, I stopped wanting to be funny. I stopped wanting to perform. I um went down a really weird route of um trying to give the best performance and trying to be as true to whatever character it was which i think is a noble idea but i took it personally i took it to a level that i don't think was sustainable and i i will be honest in the sense of, I think, I don't know if I was myself Mm -hmm. for a long time, for a very long, and I'll be real, I don't think I, I think I lost the spark that was me. Yeah. In truth, I do. I don't think I lost the spark that was me um, for the longest time. And I'm, I would say maybe in the past five, six years, I'm getting back to that and I've, like come to really enjoy in a non self masturbatory way. (laughs) I've started to really enjoy who I am again. Yeah. Which probably brings more, more, more truth into your performance as well. I think so. (laughs) Yeah. 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 
I think so. You, because when, you, when, you, when your aim, like when your goal is to be good, actually, and you just to try to you just change forget on yourself, yeah. man. You really do. And I think definitely the last three years, I've, I've, I've put myself back into a, an environment where I'm allowed to be free. So if you're going back to my, um, how I prep now, the way I prep is I realize where I am with the character, who the character is, who I am, see what aspects of me I can bring to the character, and then I make the concerted efforts you try and just play mm -hmm. within that. Yeah. And improvise and give myself permission to be grandiose, be stupid, be, be shit. Mm -hmm. Give myself permission to be fucking crap. I've never seen you be shit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but I, I, I had the pleasure to work with you quite a few times in have, class, and we're waiting at strangers. We yes. had like sure to see when I was well, destroy your back. Destroy. He pushed this guy, pushed me up, and we had to do take after take after take. And the take was literally he had to walk down the street <laughs> and push me into a into into a glass and not into a glass. Actually, it was like it a was, big thing because like I had glass, to grab it? you and, and just to kind of and I had to. To know that I need to kind of push you a little bit off and against the wall, not in the glass, because I, that would be yeah. Like so the glass, yeah, that's the thing. It wasn't glass; it was a brick wall, a <laughs> brick like wall. That, yes. uh, and we did how many takes of that? Quite a few. Quite oh a few. It was god! That, it but was it's, in. It's like, I always thought like I was kind of gentle-ish, but I'm pretty sure I could have, you know, got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing, like, yeah, it was like, it was the top of my back. It was, oh God, yeah. Yeah, we've been able to like, it was, we had a pleasure of working with each other. But I think again, it's, it's, and I say this to anyone who I'm working with now, or if I'm in a position where I'm assistant directing, or if I'm just in the class and I'm not in the class, is allow yourself to be shit and take the pressure off yourself. And you don't have to make it perfect. Yeah. Just be, just honor the world that you're in. Mm -hmm. And make the world believable but it doesn't have to be that deep. Mm. Um, try and bring a sense of enjoyment to what you're doing. Um, but I think you can only do that if you're confident on lines. Um, so oh, yes. again, uh, I'm very disciplined on my lines. I like, if I'm learning a page, I will literally put a timer on and depending, depending on um, how long the script is, how short it is, I will give myself 10 minutes. Yeah. I'll give myself 10 minutes per page. And I put a timer on and I'll just recite and I'll go over it and I'll recite it in a neutral voice. So I'm not trying to put a characterization on it mm -hmm. yet. Um, just so I know the lines and get the lines in my body. And then I do it by sometimes I, I sometimes I do my lines and recite my lines when I'm ironing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just because it's a mind numbing thing. I'm ironing, but I'm doing my lines because if I'm doing a different activity and not focusing on getting the lines right, I'm just focusing on the lines into my body. Mm -hmm. And once the lines are in your body, then you are free to improvise. Yeah. If you don't know the lines, you're on, you're, the about lines. You're on, you're on squeaky bum time. Yeah. You're on squeaky bum time. Um, know my lines, know what I'm trying to bring, know what the character is, know who the character is in this world, know who the character is to other people. This is all like the six things that Uta Hagen talks about as well. Um, and then from there, I pick and choose every kind of lesson and teacher I've had. I've, I've gone the Stanislavski route. I've gone the Uta Hagen route. I've done the David Mamet route. Um, I cherry pick. I've done the Grotowski route mm -hmm. as well. I'm currently in class with someone who was at the Grotowski Institute for years. Andrew Darren Elkins, shout out to my boy. Um, shout out to Lee Lomas as well, working at the studio. Um, I like to put, I like to put everyone who I've worked with mm -hmm up there um different different perspectives but we're all trying to pursue the same thing which is good quality and truth right um i don't know i have a i don't know whether what i'm saying is complete bullshit a lot of stuff i say is bullshit sometimes i i say i say i say gold. a lot of stuff is bullshit fake it till you make it <laughs> fake it till you make it right i think there's there's a difference in when i speak to actors about what they deem a good good performance is um uh because there's like a Venn diagram and we're, we're united on some things and I think other people are different. A lot of people who I speak to, they're not a really big fan of uh, some actors who um, are very much themselves in every role they do mm -hmm. because it's like, well, no, you're not supposed to act. You're supposed to be different. You're playing a different character. And then, but sometimes you speak to actors and go, well, no, you want to be as true to yourself as possible. And so that also, that almost um, limits the amount yeah. of differentiation you have between your character. And I'm in my brain, I'm like, it doesn't really matter. I just want to, I like the idea of uh, character first, 
then me, then character, then me, then character. And like, mm-hmm. like trying to figure out uh, that, that balance of where does the character start and where do I end and where's the mesh between the two? I think yeah. that's almost too psychological, too forensic. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that's, I think that answers the prepping situation. I don't know. I think it depends on my mood. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I like the 10 minute timer and just scri- and strictly um, honoring that. Other times I like to write out what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if I can see it, then I can do it. You know? Yeah. Um, and other times I know my lines a little bit. Mm-hmm. Or I know, I know the essence of what my line is saying, but I can only really truthfully say it once I'm in the rehearsal yeah. room, but I still need the prep to do it. Mm. I still need to prep. And then, but once you're on set or once you're on stage, that prep has to go. Yeah. Right. You've prepped enough. You can't bring your prep on, on scene. You can't bring your prep on stage. You can't bring your prep when you're filming at a thing. You're, you, you have done your prep. Yeah. And if you, and you can, I don't think you can do prep enough. I think mm. you consistently try and find something new. Yes, you settle on something. And you do sometimes, sometimes when it's way too late. Yeah. You just finally, oh my God, I, mm-hmm. I just understood. Fuck, I, I did it for, for a month. Wrongly. <laughs> I remember being on, uh, doing the tour and we were doing Midsummer Night's Dream and only really knowing what the play was about a month into it. <laughs> I've done Shakespeare. Like I made, I did, I majored. I did my masters in classical theater. So I did my masters in Greek chorus and Shakespeare. And, um, I remember one of the comments I got from the audience, which was backhanded, which was, Oh, you speak really, really well. And I was like, for what? I speak really, really well for whom, madam? Um, I think she will show you, you know what I mean? Like you're really, you're, you speak, you speak the words so brilliant. I was like, yes, I'm educated in Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> um, but doing a lot, knowing a lot of plays and doing a lot of plays and enjoying, enjoying those plays. They're so rich in imagery, but only really knowing from my perspective or my character's perspective as Oberon, um, knowing what the play was about, maybe a month into mm-hmm. it. You know, and then going, oh, mm. yeah. one of my greatest, <laughs> one of my greatest things. I was hit and miss depending on the audience was. And I like saying this, uh, just being able to call someone a cunt in Shakespeare, <laughs> just breaking up the word constable. And in some areas, <laughs> some places, depending on the audience, I would get a really big laugh. And in other areas, it would be like, you can't say that word. It was a thing, the thing line was, it was, um, it was much ado. And I was like, uh, uh, my learned constable and just depended on, um, depending on the audience and depending on what you could get away with beforehand. Mm. It was like, that was a moment of a light bulb moment of, I can get away with this. Mm. I can get away with saying my learned constable, um, <laughs> <laughs> on stage, Jane Shakespeare and depending on the audience, you'd get a really big laugh or not so much. Yeah. yeah. Well, I spoke to some of your colleagues. All of your colleagues, by the way, from uh, Hilling Andy. Yeah. That was a very, very different way of preparing, though, right? That was a fever dream. We had three or four different shoots. It was going to be a movie, and then we had so much footage. It wanted to be it turned into a TV show, um, and it was guerrilla style. So we were just on set. And the, the remarkable thing was, I think it was day one or day two. Day one, we were very much, it was controlled improvisation. Mm-hmm. We were out in public. We were filming on, on, on the, uh, uh, iPhone 14 at the time. And at the time, still the time, what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> and just going around and like the Lorenzo, the director were just giving us tad- tidbits to do and just doing it over and over again, trying different things and sometimes running over, sometimes running short. And then it was day two. We did, we had a scene in the car and he couldn't get in the car with us. So he just, he gave us the camera Mm -hmm. and it was just the four of us. It was me, Matthew, Elliot, and Freddie. And we just, you just said, this what, here's what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, improvise your way around it. Um, and we'll look at the footage. And I think the take he used, um, I think the take he was going to use was maybe the first or second take. Mm -hmm. And he said subsequently, like at towards the end, of the uh, shoot, the first shoot was, that was when I knew I could trust you guys. Yeah. Because we went off, we did what he wanted and more. Mm -hmm. And we gave him so much footage uh, that the end product of the first shoot was completely different to what he had written down. Yeah. We we didn't throw out the script, but the script and the lines became advisory. Mm -hmm. We could refer to it um, as and when, and even when we went back to shoot the second shoot and the third shoot, um, 
it was very much just, here's what I want you to say. I remember the second script wasn't a script. It was just mm -hmm. in this scene, this happens, this happens, this happens. In this scene, this happens, this happens, this happens. In this scene, da 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 da, -da. And it was very much like, okay, guys, go do your thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, it was helpful for us because we had done it before. I think some of the other actors who came in found it a little bit hard mm. because um, there was no context for them. Yeah, uh, which is which you know, is is the environment. But um, that filming was insane. We were scrambling up rocks. We were going into like we were walking around Sermione in flamingo costumes and um elliot obviously half naked because that's elliot <laughs> <laughs> with a song um it was it was completely different because we had done so many months of like rehearsal with the characters mm. that when he wrote the scripts he wrote it in what we some of the things we had said yeah. but then when we went on 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 stage on film it was completely different mm. and it was it was a real pleasure for me um, being on the set, especially the first couple of days and seeing, especially Freddie, uh, come out of his shell. Mm. And I think I remember coming back to class and saying it. Yeah. Um, I remember that, which was my character wasn't needed for maybe the first three days. And I found, I found it really difficult the first three days mm. because I was in and out. I was, my character was in and out because we didn't need to shoot those scenes yet. And it was hard. It was really hard for me to be not on set, but here, because we were shooting where we were sleeping. We were shooting where we were staying. So in, when we were in the house, I don't know if any of the footage, I don't know if that footage stays anymore. I don't know. Anyway, in the first, in the first shoot we had, we were shooting on location. And so we were sleeping where we were shooting. And I had to be like downstairs, but I could hear the acting going on and by day three we were j it was basically being feeling the plane take off mm -hmm. and almost being left on the runway um and i made i had yeah. to make a choice whether i was gonna let the plane fly away from me mm -hmm. and just not be part of what was going on mm -hmm. or running and jumping onto the wheel and trying to climb onto the main compartment and, and find my way and find my footing and seeing Freddy, especially Freddy, um, take off and fly with his character that he plays Holger. Um, and witnessing that and just going, this is how you make a movie. This is how you make a TV show. You just, whatever's there with you, you roll with the punches. And I also found it very difficult to play almost a straight man in that role in terms of the character of all the other ones. I have my eccentricities, but almost being the foil for Freddy, Freddy's hyperactiveness and Matt's um, just fucking wimpish, wimpish character and Elliot's drug fueled psychosis. <laughs> um, almost being the straight, almost being the straight man for that, but also being able to, to give the uh, reaction shots. A lot of my humor came from the reaction of, yeah. uh, what their characters were doing and sometimes joining in on the, on the fun and craziness and also sometimes not, and also being willing to go and doing some really like disgusting shit as well. Um, it was really fun, really rewarding. I can't wait for it to be produced. I can't wait for it to, to see what happens yeah. with it. You yeah. know? Because um, I've heard a lot about it right now. Yeah. And, and it's just like, I want to see it. And also I've, I've heard that there are some news, there are some, some producers who are interested in something like that. Um, I think Elliot, Freddie told me last week, or Elliot, some, there's some producers now who have been assigned to it and attached to it. And it's been yeah. like a year since yeah. we, almost a year since we wrapped finally, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it was a really, really fun experience, really fun shooting in, uh, around Lake Garda, Samione, all that area. Um, it was really, really fun. Yeah. Really, 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 really great experience. I think it was really enjoyable. You know, you're out there with, with your friends. And so your the friendships that you see, that you, hopefully you see, are actually real and authentic. <laughs> and there's, ah, I don't know if I should say this. Um, there was one, we were shooting till like maybe four in the morning. We were supposed to wrap at 12 and mm -hmm. we shot at four. We were supposed to yeah. get up at eight to go on. And it was really difficult. And Elliot was, you know, I'm, I'm going to say it. Elliot, Elliot wasn't happy with 
his take. And we were very, all very much tired. He wasn't very, we tried to do the same take and he was, mm. he was struggling to try and find the emotional depth that he needed. But it was two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. And we had to move on. Mm. We had to move on. And we'd already shot the subsequent scene, the scene the, the day before. Mm. And where it was, we'd shot that scene and it was a one taker. It was a one take. Mm. And we did the other take we tried and it was just like, no, we're not going to do it. It's one take, we got it. And we were trying to match because of continued match the energy we had the day before. And we just, when you try it, it's inauthentic. Um, whereas he got, he got the take. He had actually got the take, like one of the first takes he'd done. Maybe the first, second or third take he'd done. Mm-hmm. But we were like 15 takes deep. <laughs> and it was like, it was frustration. And we had to move on. And we were rolling. And I remember he, he just kind of veered off because he just wasn't in the moment. And, I logistically, I'm not shouting myself out, but I logistically knew you have to be in this car. You have to be here. So you can't be over there, brother. Mm-hmm. I had the camera on. I, Freddie had the camera on me and I don't know if it makes it in. I really don't. But um, I have like a 30 second thing where I'm just, my character's just at him. Mm-hmm. And it's me speaking to Elliot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's me speaking to Elliot going, get your fucking ass in the car, brother, because we need you. You know what I mean? But it was through the voice of my character, Uh Malcolm, speaking to his character. Um, But we finished it. And I think Lorenzo, the director, afterwards, when he watched it, was like, I don't know if I can cut that footage because Uh it's so intrinsic and it's so in character, so in the moment. But that's what happens when you're on set. When you're able to speak and have a vehicle as a character, your own personality will always come through, Mm -hmm. right? and so there were so many moments like that where it's just us as human beings speaking to another human being. Yeah. Um, but you do it under the guise of a character. And that was the freedom that we had, which was really, really beautiful, really, really lovely. I really enjoyed that experience. Yeah. Um, I hope we're able to do a series too. Yeah, I really great. do. I really do. I hope we're able to embody these characters again. Mm. I really do. But yeah, <laughs> nice. I, I can't. I can't wait to see it because I've heard, I can't. I can't heard wait to so see much it. Love about it <laughs> and from Ellen, how he was like swimming, you know, after the the, the, the swan. Oh God, <laughs> there's a scene. Mm, if we ever get onto Jonathan Ross show, if we ever get onto the Graham Norton show, we might say it. I won't say it yet. I don't want to ruin it yet. But there's a scene uh, where Elliot does some. There are scenes, <laughs> multiple scenes where Elliot does something crazy and it's just someone's dared him to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Elliot's just gone, okay, <laughs> I'm going to dive into a lake and swim after a swan and then have a swan chase me. And me and Matt just walk off and go, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> just, can we go? Can we get on? We, we are running out of time. We have a limited amount of time to do this and someone just aired dead Elliot to go get a swan or swim the lake. And it's like, Brav, brava. Like there's there's so many moments where you are like, as an actor, this is fun. As an actor, you're like, bruv, mm-hmm. my career. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh dear, I keep coming out in and out of shot. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we have we have time for maybe one more question. One more question. What do you want to know, brother? Obsidian Theatre Company. You're yeah. a founder. Tell me about it. Okay, so I I founded it. Oh God, what year are we in now? Twenty twenty four. I founded it maybe two three years ago. Um, I haven't really been able to do much with it in truth because um, family issues, uh, which I'm not going to go into, um, that has kind of preoccupied my time. But I think towards the end of this year, maybe towards next year. Um, I will be actively pursuing it again. The whole premise of it is essentially I was wanting to talk about, about culture. And I think there's this whole thing with, uh, black theater. What is black theater? But I think it's less about black theater and it's more about black stories. And I say black because African stories or the African diaspora story. So that includes the Caribbean. It includes everything is the Caribbean, you know? Um, but talking about the culture and the stories of people who lived in those times. And the reason why it came about is because 
I don't know whether it's true. I am ascertaining and I am therefore putting out there mm -hmm. that there is potentially, once my grandma's generation do pass, there will be a potentially a generation of people who don't know the stories of their grandparents. Yeah. You know, I, I don't like labels, but if I was going to label myself, for example, I would then say I am a Jamaican, half Jamaican, half Guyanese, British born person. That subsection, that subsection, the limit, kind of like I said, you put you in a, in a, in a bracket. I don't like putting myself in a bracket, but that is who I am. And I have been to Jamaica 10 times. I've been to Guyana no times. I, especially going back 10 years ago, I would say that one of the places I really feel at home is Jamaica. Mm. But I remember the first time, maybe the second time I went there, we touched down the door, the door opened and the heat hits you like a force wave. And you're out there and you're, you touch the ground and I don't, something in me was like, I'm home. Mm. I'm just like, I'm home. And as much as I've lived in England, I feel, I felt really at home. And as I've got older, I realized I really enjoyed sitting around the table at Christmas or any big family events and hearing like my Aunt Deslin um, or my mum or my Aunt, Aunt Bernice when she, uh, when she was alive, Aunt B, um, talking about their childhood and their stories. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing about the obsidian is almost capturing those stories in a bottle and using that as plays or stories or um, video footage and actually just talking about culture. Yeah. There, I think there is, I think there is a big emphasis on uh, black or ethnic minority, this that, and the other, but you are not actually honoring the fact that within that title, there are so many different cultures. The Caribbean, the Caribbean has a culture, but each individual island has its own individual culture. Yeah. You know, Africa, you talk about the amount of countries that are in that within the, within the countries, you've got so many different cultures. You of course, know? like, that's a huge continent. It's a huge continent. Yes. So within the continent of Africa, within the countries that are within Africa, within those countries, just like England, the, the, the uh, London culture is not the same as Southampton. And England Brighton. is like this And England big. is that big yeah. compared to Africa, which yeah. is double that, yeah. you know? So <laughs> <laughs> I just realized what I did there. <laughs> oh, fuck, <laughs> you're a bad man. Um, but I know. But within, but it's, 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 what we really need to really talk about is culture. Mm -hmm. and Because re London has its own culture. Yeah. London, the black, I would say black people in London uh, have a completely, and people, and anyone who lives in a heavily minority area, ethnic minority area, minority, whatever, um, you have a culture. There is a culture in London. Mm -hmm. um, London has a culture. The boroughs in London have their own, like, their different culture. Um, and I felt, and I feel like when we talk about black theatre, we kind of should be talking more about the culture, the different cultures, yeah. rather than just the term of blackness. Because there's a, there was a term going around um, a long time ago, which was like, black people are not a monolith, right? And what they're basically saying is not all black people think alike. I can't speak for the next black person down the road. I can't, why would I? Yeah. Um, my, my formative years are completely different to someone who grew up in uh, anywhere. Yeah, of course. And depending on the different borough, if you're South London, you have like an identity. If you're North London, you have an identity. You know, there are always little like South London, North London, East London, and West. <laughs> West always gets, West always gets a fucking, like a punch in the face. It's so funny. Just West is shit, man. <laughs> it genuinely is. West is just shit. <laughs> There's nothing there. There's nothing I'm there. there. I'm there. <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> there is something. It's me. Anyways, you th the funny thing, like I just, I just thought about it just a couple of days ago, because I, I've heard this sort of like, oh, black culture. I was like, what, what, what is black culture? Like this is whole continent of different countries of like completely, like well, not completely different, but cultures probably like you know they well, change. 
Well, like, well yes and no. From I one think, side to another. So yeah, you know? it can. So I think I think that there is a pervasive or general thing where like like a lot of black families, whether you are African, whether you're Caribbean, whether you are American, there is like, there is almost a universal language. So there is that. There is, but it's, it's so nuanced. And I think it's, well, what do you I mean actually by universal think, language? There is like, there is like dance and dance of languages. But here's, like, here's the thing. I think if I was gonna psychologically um, try and articulate it, it would be actually in how we deal with white people. <laughs> So I shouldn't know about that. <laughs> genuinely, I genuinely think I think it's like being black in a white country. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of uh, we talk about code switching that, but there's also like general observations that um, just intellectually, it just intellectually, whether you are African American, African American, Black American, um, Black British, uh, and then from that the subsection of whether you're Black British, African. Or Black British Caribbean, it doesn't really matter. It, when you're dealing with like the the white mm -hmm. <laughs> space, I feel like there is a a universal language. Well, I ain't gonna give you no secrets, bro. Yeah, right, um, of course, of course. I, I feel like I, any black person ignorance is a bliss, by the way, <laughs> may understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. However, there is also within that there is a different culture in terms of uh, where you're from or where your family yeah, is from, yeah. um, and it. You know, London's predominantly Nigerian, Ghanaian, Jamaican. Within that, you then have Grenadians, you have Bayesians, you have um, uh, St. Lucians. You have a lot of different, like, people within the diaspora mm -hmm. living here. Now, the culture of my, how I'm going to say it, I could be wrong. I actually am going to put my hand up and say I probably am wrong. But it's a case of my understanding of it or my observation of it is that there is a general culture which we all understand and which we all on the service, mm -hmm. on the surface, when we live our daily lives, we all have a communal kind of nod or whatever it is, or just general thing that we black people do or understand. But within that, underneath that is the person. Mm -hmm. And within that person is the culture of who their parents are or who their grandparents are when they came over. Mm -hmm. um, if you got, if you're like, Mm. I was about to go on a rant there and I actually have to check myself because I don't know if I can back up what I was about to say. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'm going to pause there on that. I, I just feel that when it comes to black British culture, black London culture is heavily influential, mm -hmm. um, which is a, an amazing, beautiful thing. But within that, there are different areas of black communities in this country and they are also influenced by where they live. But then also you've then got the idea of, and again, I think I maybe I'm being a little bit too forensic and maybe I'm thinking a little, a little bit too deep. I don't know. Um, there is a British culture that is not imposed, but understood on top of that. But then on top of that, you've then got whether you are African and then which country you're from, whether you're from Zimbabwe, whether you're from Ghana. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether you're Nigerian, whether you're Kenyan, you know, and then on top of that, you've then got whether you're Jamaican. And then you've also then got like the idea of whether your parents are from a certain generation or your grandparents from a certain generation, what their relationships are mm -hmm. to other black people, other white people, and also then your influence on where you grew up. Yeah. So for me, growing up in Yule, um, I have maybe a understanding and a generic understanding of you know, black culture, yeah, of course. But then I have a different perspective of um, living in London, living in England, living in, living who I live in my life to someone who maybe grew up in a area that was heavy policed. I, I said that only because um, of a thought that just came into my mind, which was, I remember having a new car. I bought it that day. I had the, the, the slip, the new, the new, the new car slip in here because my dad told me to. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember it had, cause it hadn't really, really been registered yet or updated on the yeah. DBLA. I remember driving from my house all the way up through Fort and Heath up to fucking, oh, I don't even know where I was going. I can't remember where I was going, but up there into London, past Norwood and into like maybe Dulwich. I was probably going to Dulwich to be fair. 
and all the way where it's like majority white areas, there were police uh, behind me, uh, in and out, in and out, in and out, sitting behind me in traffic, and nothing happened to me. Mm. The minute I crossed over is like Lam- Lambeth Barra and L- L- Lambeth Barra and then further onwards. Um, the first time I was sitting in traffic and I was a police car going the other way and he just stared at me, drew a little bit longer, looked at my number plate and then just put on the blues. Mm-hmm. And he accused me of stealing the car and I literally was like, I ain't got nothing, but look, if you want me to reach down here, mm-hmm. I've got the fact that I own this car. I've got the proof right here. Picked it up, gave it to him. It was just really interesting that in certain, car- in certain areas I can drive freely and then uh, in one particular borough, as I cross the borough, I immediately get pulled. Because I'm immediately a person of suspicion. Now you can say that's racism or something, but that is a almost like, I don't know if that's culture, but I know that that experience affects you. can affect and I will then affect the culture in which you're growing up in. And then will also then affect the stories. And then there's also now then an element of who are you and what language do you speak as a community when you are heavily policed yeah. and whether you're heavily not policed. And then, but, and if, and if you break it down to that level, then you have to then accept, at least in my mind, you have to then accept that depending on where you are, depending on your outlook on life and depending on the community you live in and who are your influences, your culture within a certain culture will be different. And so, which is a little bit different away from what I was saying beforehand, but I believe in my opinion that that affects the stories you want to tell. Yeah. And it affects the stories that you create. It affects the stories and the outlook of how you deal with people. And with Obsidian, my whole plan and my idea, and it's a really broad scope, I'm trying to bring it down, is understanding different cultures and telling stories from those cultures and giving people a space to express themselves and giving people a space to um, talk about what they want to talk about and why they want to talk about it. Because you talk about black history as a whole blanket of thing, uh, black history or world of slaves. No, 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 no. That's part of the history. Yeah. You know, of everyone's history. It's part of the history, it's part of everyone's history, but let's talk about the black people that built Hadrian's Wall. Yeah. Or let's talk about the black Roman emperors. <laughs> let's talk about the black people and the and Arabic people that um, invented maths yeah. and washing and hygiene and irrigation and how- yeah, it's not needed. That's you know so I mean? Let's talk about, we were so, and that's, that's from different cultures. Yeah. That is different people's stories. That is different people's heritage. Yeah. Let's talk about heritage. That's, so that's, all encompassing what I kind of, and it's a big, it's a big task. I don't think I can do it alone. I don't want to do it alone. I very much envision it being a collaboration and uh, being part of a vehicle to help. I mean, predominantly start off being black because that's who I am. Mm. That's all I know. Um, And then from there, yeah, just giving people space. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I'm the right person to do it, but it's an idea that I have. And if anyone else wants to fucking run with it, run with it, man. Yeah. So, how can you know? people who want to work with you and maybe participate in the Obsidian uh, contact you? You can contact me on Insta, man. You can also me on Insta. I've got Obsidian Theatre Company as an Instagram account, or you can contact me on Instagram. My handle is it's underscore. Sam underscore you underscore L because you know it's Samuel <laughs> um, <laughs> passive aggressive okay. now it's full circle that's how it works okay bliss round ready, on, ready. very quickly three two one bliss round do you have a little round. like credit okay bliss round <laughs> <laughs> I will keep it. I will not have any effects there. This round. <laughs> Let's go. Texting or talking? Uh, voice note. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Sorry, cats. Dogs. Dog, cats are cool. Dogs are great. Guilty pleasure? Oh, chocolate. Yeah. Rocky yeah. caramel, specifically. Rocky. Rocky oh caramel. Oh my God, you're a monster. Rocky oh. caramel. Rocky caramel. <laughs> mint clubs. Um, what else? What else would I just fucking yam? Um, yeah, it's all food, food, food what is my guilty pleasure. What makes you laugh? 
Um, I I find a lot of things funny, but people being weird and people's quirks are are. I love laughing with people. Yeah, I love laughing at people too. Oh, yeah. But I love laughing with people. Um, so yeah, yeah. All right. What makes you angry? The list is is being submitted now. Uh, a lot of things. <laughs> Everyone's going to say, "Oh my god!" Like social injustice, which obviously, yeah. yeah. But like, it's just a little thing. Sometimes it's people who 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 walk slowly or stop on the street. Oh. It's it's just an irrational thing because I do this thing. Do you ever do this thing where you're on the pavement and you're like, um, like in your in a race? <laughs> I win all the time, and then when I start losing, I retire. <laughs> 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 but yeah, people who stop in front of you in the street, people who people who who just um, dawdle when it's traffic jams, like come on, let's just move up, let's just get this train going. So yeah, wasting time. Uh, one dish you cook best? Uh, rice and peas, jerk chicken, plant in. Um, yeah. Favorite character from any fictional story? Ah, Dozo Blint, Way of Shadows, um, Night Angel trilogy. Uh, I love I love that character so so much. Star Wars or the Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. Yes. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. I like the Trekkies. I think you're great. Don't come for me. Captain Picard is great, but he was better as Charles Xavier. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any unknown? Like, Actually, pause to- that though. Yeah. Shout out to William Shatner and like the first on screen mixed race kiss. Shout out. Really, really cool stuff. But I'm still a Star Wars fan. Hmm. It's a great story. Um, it's just the Bible story. <laughs> the, any unknown unexpected talents teach karate play guitar um, at the same time yeah uh, yeah I do musical karate shows <laughs> <laughs> uh, although I've retired from competing because I'm old and broken yeah <laughs> have you competed for long yeah but yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it All right. <laughs> how often do you cry there was a time when I was ashamed to cry, and then now I I, I don't cry often, but I don't stop it from when it happens. Yeah, you know, you know, life yeah. happens. You sometimes you, you need you need an outlet. I think bottling it up and not being able to cry and being a man, or not showing weakness. I think a lot of times, especially black men, like for me as a child, crying was a form of weakness, mm-hmm. and you're meant to be you know, better than everyone else. And you're meant to be tougher and stronger than everyone else. And that is a probably a generalization and a culture thing that maybe a lot of black men can attest to, mm-hmm. especially, especially if you're around the nineties, two thousands, you're, you are meant to be better than everyone else because you have to go be two times better to go half as far. That was a thing that is drilled into me. And then as I've grown up, it's been drilled into every other black person mm-hmm. I know. So as a black person, I'd hate framing it like that, but I know for me, there was a time when crying wasn't an option and showing your weakness and showing that people affected you wasn't an option. Mm. But when I'm at home and I'm in my own or, you know, with my girl and like you're able to be vulnerable mm. um, and finding, finding a place where you can be vulnerable and peace, then yeah, I, if, I, if I need to cry, I will cry. Yeah. Yeah, if I need to let out, I'll cry. Bottling it up doesn't help. Bottling it up makes you aggressive and not a nice person to be around. Yeah. So, true. yeah. All right. One final thing. It's one cool thing. Something that you really like and you think our viewers or listeners. I'm a geek. To... Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. And, and maybe there is some particular campaign that you enjoy. Or maybe there is your campaign that you're kind of... I'm not in a campaign anymore. Mastering. I haven't been in a campaign in a while because everyone I play with has kind of scattered. Um, and I'm not a really big fan of the online idea of it. I like to play it in person. If but you find people to play in person, can you, can you call me as well? I, I will. Do it. I will definitely. I want to do it. Do it. <laughs> I, I, think it I think if you're an actor, yeah. I think if you are an actor, um, I think you should play. Yes, it's geeky. Yes, it's like we can be nerdy and that kind of stuff. I love leaning into that. I've been a nerd. I mean, I fucking love Dragon Ball Z. I, mean, I, I scope on the nerd side of things all the time, right? But I've never found investment in character or investment in improvisation mm-hmm. or like understanding that you can influence the story so much clearer and so much cleaner than in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I think I am a big fan of like, uh, Dimension 20 and Critical Role, who are like big online campaigners. Um, I think if you are a, if you are a critter or anything like that, um, I think Brendan Lee Mulligan is the greatest living 
uh, game master of all time. That is my opinion, and my opinion is fact. Okay, um, he is just insane. Um, but I think what it has allowed, what it does allow people, is if you are creative, it gives you the outlet. Mm -hmm. to kind of be creative in a space where you can be creative with your friends. Okay, look, man, Fuck we're sake. run out of space. Of space and it time. Was, it was such a nice conversation, man. I really, mm -hmm. really enjoyed it. Thank Hope you. we'll do it again. We will, uh, hopefully. And this is great framing. I'll see the house plan outside. Uh, we're making it look good. <laughs> Secrets of a trade. <laughs> if you enjoyed the, the podcast, mm -hmm. if you enjoyed the episode, leave your comments, tell us what you think about it, and uh, subscribe, like, and Goodbye. Ciao. <laughs>